Hey guys. This is part 10 of what if Naruto was Azula's bodyguard. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God in her history. Chapter 26 Grudges and Promises Location Fire Nation They had made camp on the top of a small mountain. They sat around the campfire, telling ghost stories, as it was the perfect kind of night to do. Sokka had just finished with his story, much to Aang and Toph's curiosity. Well? He asked them. I think I like the man with a sword for a hand better, Aang told him. This one didn't have the same level of scariness as that one. Not my greatest, I'll admit, he agreed. Water tribe's slumber parties must stink, Tove commented. Though it could be better than any air nomad stories Twinkle Toes have told us. Aang grinned sheepishly. Since we're always in the temples, we don't have any interesting stories to tell other than the ones about where a monk discovers some secret passageway within the air temples. No, wait. I've got one, Katara said from where she sat in front of the fire. And this is a true southern water tribe story. Is this one of those a friend of my cousin knew some guy that this happened to stories? Sokka asked her as he sat down, sticking the tip of his jian into the ground. No, it happened to mom. That got everyone's attention. One winter when mom was a girl, a snowstorm buried the whole village for weeks. A month later, mom noticed she hadn't seen her friend Nini since the storm. So mom and some others went to check on Nini's family. When they got there, no one was home. Just a fire flickering in the fireplace remained. While the men went out to search, Mom stayed at the house. When she was alone, she heard a voice it's so cold and I can't get warm. Mom turned and saw Nini standing by the fire. She was blue like she had been frozen. Mom ran outside for help, but when everyone came back, Nini was gone. Where'd she go? Her brother asked, desperately trying to hide behind the stump he was sitting against. That story was creepy and he was sure that he had seen that house. No one knows, she answered. Nini's house remains empty to this day, but sometimes, people see smoke coming up from the chimney, like little Nini is still trying to get warm. The silence that followed felt almost scaring to them. Wait! Tove suddenly cried, placing her hand on the ground. Guys, did you hear that? She stood up as the others held each other in fright. I hear people under the mountain. And they're screaming. Nice try, Sokka said after forcing himself to calm down and let go of his sister. Akela, however, just rolled his eyes at the tribesmen. No, I'm serious. I hear something. You're probably just jumpy from the ghost stories, Katara told her. She knew that she was. The blind earthbender would have protested, had she not felt a change. It just stopped, she said. All right, now I'm getting scared, Aang declared. Hello, children, a voice said from out of nowhere making Sokka, Aang, and Katara scream in fright and hug Tof. The voice came from an old lady standing in the shadows of the forest. Sorry to frighten, she told them, walking into the firelight. My name is Hama. You children shouldn't be out in the forest by yourselves at night. I have an inn nearby. Why don't you come back there for some spiced tea and warm beds? Yes, please, Sokka said. She walked away and they followed. You got everything, Azula? Naruto asked standing by her door. He was watching her getting dressed and getting everything she needed for the day. Yes, she answered, turning to face him. Where are the others? They're already waiting for us. Then let's go. She walked out of her room and Naruto followed her. They walked down the corridor before running into Yao Jing. They didn't say anything and neither did she. She just kept on walking and so did they. I think that's the first time she didn't at least try and kill you or me with a glare the blonde remarked as he took a quick look back. You're right. It feels somewhat weird, Azula agreed as she looked at him. According to the servants, Chun's photo is always with her, he informed her. It had fallen to the floor one morning, and the maid knelt down to pick it up. Yao Jing almost killed her for doing that until she apologized profusely and fled. Are you sure? They would never lie about something like that. She's gotten possessive about it. And that was something he never would have thought she'd do. He had thought that she would burn the photo. Ironic, isn't it? She asked. That she'd be possessive about the photo of the mother she didn't like when she met her. I would be too if I had one. She flinched when she heard that. 
Sorry. Why do you people keep apologizing? He asked with a joking smile. You're beginning to make it sound like you murdered my parents. Even though it was a joke, she still winced a little. Thankfully, they met up with everyone else before he saw it. There you guys are, Tylee said with a small pout from where she stood on the steps. It was obvious that the acrobat had been waiting a while. Sorry, she wanted to make sure she had everything, Naruto told her. Azula didn't say anything in reply. Um, guys? Do we have to do this? Cory asked hesitantly from where she sat on the steps. She hadn't planned on doing this and quite frankly, she was still unsure about. Yes, we have to, Mai said, standing next to Zuko. Come on, Cory, it's your last day here in the Fire Nation, Tamari told her. We might as well spend it having fun. I know, but I was supposed to stay a few more weeks, she said sadly. That had been the plan. I'm sorry that your father sent you a letter saying he wants you to come home earlier than expected, Cory. But what's happened has happened, Azula told her. Now let's go have some fun. Time for shopping, cheered Tylee. The girls all started down the steps leading away from the palace. The guys just stayed there for a couple of more minutes. Men, Naruto said to Zuko, Gara, and Kankuro with a solemn voice. This will probably be the last chance to pray to whatever deity or spirit that gives you strength. I'd recommend praying to them because we will soon be shopping with girls. Hey you guys. Hurry up. Cory called from down the steps. We'll be right down. Naruto told her before looking back at the other three guys. They all said a quick prayer and joined them. Thanks for letting us stay here tonight. Katara told Hama as they all sat around a table inside the inn. You have a lovely inn. Aren't you sweet? Hama said. You know you should be careful. People have been disappearing in those woods you were camping in, she told them as she sat down in her own chair. What do you mean disappearing? Sokka asked. When the moon turns full, people walk in, and they don't come out. Who wants more tea? She asked them, holding up the kettle. They all looked at her with nervous expressions. Don't worry, you are all completely safe here. Why don't I show you to your rooms and you can get a good night's rest? She took them to their rooms. They went to sleep or at least tried. Sokka was kept awake by the creaking of the house. After a particular loud one, he grabbed his jian and drew it. Akela, having heard the jian being drawn, opened his eyes and raised his head. His expression pretty much said would you put that thing away? I'm trying to sleep here. Sorry, Akela, he said, putting the jian back in its scabbard. But this place is creepy. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to fall asleep. The wolf just rolled his eyes and put his head back down. He went back to sleep and within fifteen minutes, Saka had joined him. When he opened them next, he was halfway on the floor and saw both Hama and Katara standing over him. Time to go shopping, declared Hama. I hate shopping with girls, Zuko, Gara, Kankuro, and Naruto thought in unison as they walked behind the girls. As the guys in the group, they were the pack meals. Zuko and Naruto got lucky when Mai and Azula respectively targeted them as their pack meals. Given that they didn't shop much and as such, didn't buy every single thing they laid eyes on, their loads were fairly light. Kankuro and Gara weren't so lucky. Look, another store, Tylee said, pointing at said store. We noticed, Naruto told her dryly as everyone turned to look at the store. It's another clothes store, Cory pointed out to the acrobat. We've already been to plenty of those. But it's not just any clothes store, Tylee said slyly. She knew what kind of store it was having been there several times before. Oh, please don't tell me it's not what I think it is, the guys thought again in unison. They were really hoping that it wasn't what they thought it was. It's an undergarment store. They walked through the marketplace carrying baskets of food. Saka used his jian to carry his. That Mr. Yao seems to have a thing for you, Katara noted to the old innkeeper. Maybe we should go back and see if he'll give us some free Komodo sausages? You would have me use my feminine charms to take advantage of that poor man? Hama asked her with a raised eyebrow before cracking a smile. I think you and I are going to get along swimmingly. You won't have any ash bananas till next week? They heard a customer ask a shopkeeper as they passed by. Well, I have to send the boy to Hingwa Island to get them, and it's a two-day trip, the shopkeeper explained. Oh, right. Tomorrow's the full moon. The customer sounded nervous when he said that. Exactly. I can't lose another delivery boy in the woods. Something is going on here in this town, Saka stated. He Aang and Tof were a little behind Katara and Hama, 
so they could talk amongst themselves. Maybe they offended a spirit? Ng suggested. I bet if we take a little walk around town, we'll find out what these people did to offend it. Not everything that happens to people have to do with the spirits, Ng, the tribesman reminded him. I know that, but I can still help people. It's what I do, he said with an easy grin. I never said you didn't. Why don't you take all those things back to the inn? Hama suggested to the group, stopping in the middle of the street. I just have to run a couple more errands. I'll be back in a little while. This is a mysterious little town you have here. Saka told her right to her face. Mysterious town for mysterious children, she replied cryptically before walking away. They made their way back to the inn and started to put the food away. That Hama seems a little strange, Saka told them as he placed a basket on the table. Like she knows something, or she's hiding something. That's ridiculous, Katara replied as she placed her basket on the counter while Aang and Tof put the rest of the baskets on the ground. She's a nice woman who took us in and gave us a place to stay. She kinda reminds me of Gran Gran. But what did she mean by that comment mysterious children? He asked his sister. Gee, I don't know, she said sarcastically. Maybe because she found four strange kids camping in the woods at night? Isn't that a little mysterious? He still didn't buy it. I'm going to take a look around. He walked away to look around the house. The other three couldn't just stand there. They went after him. Saka. Saka, what are you doing? She asked him as he climbed a staircase. You can't just snoop around someone's house. It'll be fine, he told her as he went looking through rooms, trying to find something out of the ordinary for someone from the Fire Nation. She could be home any minute, Aang pointed out. They would have a hell of a time trying to explain themselves if they got caught. Saka, you're going to get us all in trouble, Katara told him. And this is just plain rude. I'm not finished yet, he replied as he tried to open a cupboard. Come on. He managed to open it, revealing puppets shaped like humans. He was surprised but managed to hold himself from stumbling back and drawing his yin. Okay, I know Kankaro used puppets, but that's still pretty creepy, Aang admitted. The puppets before them looked lifelike, almost too lifelike. So, she's got a hobby. There's nothing wrong with that, Katara reasoned as Sokka closed the cabinet and kept on walking. Sokka, you've looked enough. Hama will be back soon, she tried to tell her brother. He climbed the stairs into the attic and tried to open a door, only to find it locked. She's just an ordinary puppet-loving innkeeper, huh? He asked. Then why does she have a locked door up here? Probably to keep people like you from snooping through her stuff. Sometimes she wondered if her brother didn't understand the concept of the word privacy. We'll see. The tribesman looked through the keyhole to see what was inside. It's empty, except for a little chest, he told them all. Maybe it's treasure, Tove suggested. Saka drew his jian and used it to pick the lock. Saka, what are you doing? Katara demanded. You're breaking into a private room. I have to see what's in there. His curiosity was aroused and damn it, he was going to satisfy it. The lock clinked and the door opened. We shouldn't be doing this. Aang said as they walked into the room. Sokka ignored him as he picked up the chest and tried to open it. Maybe there's a key around here, the tribesman said, realizing it was locked. Ooh, hand it over, Tof told him. He handed her the chest. She took off her bracelet and bent it into the shape of a key, which she stuck into the lock and began to work on it. Come on, come on. This isn't as easy as it looks, she remarked while Katara kept looking on nervously. Guys, I don't know about this, Aang said. This is crazy, I'm leaving, Katara declared. Suit yourself, Sokka told her. Do it, Tof. As she walked away, Tof successfully managed to pick the lock, opening it. Katara came back as they began to open it. I'll tell you what's in the box, Hama said from behind them, catching them by surprise. They turned around to face her while Sokka tried to hide it behind his back. She walked and then waited. He relented and handed the box to her. She took it, opened it, and pulled out a comb. It's an old comb? Sokka asked, completely surprised by the fact. It's my greatest treasure, she told him. It's the last thing I own from growing up in the Southern Water Tribe. What she said stunned both Sokka and Katara. You're from the Southern Water Tribe? Katara repeated, making sure she didn't hear wrong. Just like you, she said, putting the comb back in the box. How did you know? They had tried to keep it a secret from everyone they had met in the Fire Nation. I heard you talking around your campfire. 
But why didn't you tell us? Sokka asked, suspicious. Ever since he met her, he felt that something felt off about her. The fact that she was from the Southern Water Tribe did nothing to quash that feeling. I wanted to surprise you, she told them. I bought all this food today so I could fix you a big Water Tribe dinner. Of course, I can't get all the ingredients I need here, but ocean kumquats are a lot like sea prunes if you stew them long enough. Great, Aang muttered, remembering his last experience with sea prunes. It was not pleasant. I knew I felt a bond with you right away, Katara said. She knew she had been right when she felt that Hama felt like Gran Gran. Sorry we were sneaking around, Sokka told Hama, his voice full of apology. Apology accepted, she replied. Now let's get cooking. No, Naruto said. Please, Tylee asked them with a pout. No, Zuko said. It's for Cory, the acrobat urged them. Um, I don't think we actually need them in the store, Cory said. She knew that she didn't need them in there. There you see? Kankaro asked Tylee. We'll stay out here, Gara said, crossing his arms and silently daring the girls to say something in protest. Forget it, Tylee. They're not going to come into the store for undergarments, Mai said. She didn't know why her bubbly friend wanted them to come in the first place, considering what happened last time with Naruto. Thank you, Mai, Naruto told her. But having them in there is half the fun, Tai Lee complained. For you, accused Kankuro. He did not see any fun for men inside that kind of store. Tai Lee, we do have an excuse not to go in there. It's for the sake of our health, the blonde explained to her. How's that an excuse? It sounded like a weak one to her. Look at us. He gestured to him and the other men in the group. We're hot. If we go into that store, one of us might realize that we might need to get something. So, we'll grab it and go to the back to try it on. And I'm pretty sure you remember what happened the last time I did that in a closed store. Imagine that times four. He's got a point, Tylee, Corey said with a light blush on her cheeks. She had heard that story and she could see it happening. But she didn't want that kind of chaos. Let's just go inside, please. Fine, she said with annoyance. They walked into the store and began to browse. What did they think we were going to do to them? As if to answer her question, a small knife flew and slammed into the wooden wall in front of her. Attached to the knife was a piece of paper. As the others gathered around her, she looked at the piece of paper, which read, Do I have to list the reasons I gave at Kozan again? Naruto, how does he keep doing that? She demanded. You're never going to find out, Tai Lee, so drop it, Azula told her before walking away to look at something. After Aang had run to the shed to feed Appa and Momo, everyone sat down to a water tribe dinner. I'd steer clear of the sea prunes, the air nomad whispered to Toph. I thought they were ocean kumquats, she replied, not bothering to whisper back. Close enough. Who wants five flavor soup? Hama asked. They all raised their hands, except for Toph, who just shrugged. To their surprise, she bent the soup out of the dish and into their bowls. You're a waterbender, Katara exclaimed in delight. I've never met a waterbender from our tribe. That's because the Fire Nation wiped them all out, she replied sadly. I was the last one. So how did you end up out here? Sokka asked her. That part was the one that was making him curious. I was stolen from my home, she said as the memories flashed through her mind. It was over sixty years ago when the raid started. They came again and again, each time rounding up more of our waterbenders and taking them captive. We did our best to hold them off, but our numbers dwindled as the raids continued. Finally, I too was captured. I was led away in chains, the last waterbender of the Southern Water Tribe. Katara walked over and put her hands on her shoulders in comfort. They put us in terrible prisons here in the Fire Nation. I was the only one who managed to escape. How did you get away? Sokka asked, still suspicious of her. And why did you stay in the Fire Nation? Wouldn't she have wanted to come home? I'm sorry, she said after a moment of silence. It's too painful to talk about it anymore. We completely understand, Katara told her. We lost our mother in a raid. Oh, you poor things, she patted the young waterbender's hand. I can't tell you what it means to meet you, Katara told her. It's an honor. You're a hero. I never thought I'd meet another southern waterbender, she replied with a smile. I'd like to teach you what I know so you can carry on the southern tradition when I'm gone. Yes. Yes, of course. The young waterbender cried excitedly, standing up and clasping her hands together. 
To learn about my heritage, it would mean everything to me. Hold that thought, Saka said, standing up. Sorry, Hama, but our group needs to have a talk. Please don't let me stop you, she told him, the smile still on her face. The four of them, including Akela, walked out of the house and into the shed. What's this all about, Saka? Ng asked. The tribesmen turned to face the group once the door to the shed was closed. Katara, I want you to stay away from Hama. Something doesn't feel right about her, he told his sister. Enough with your paranoia, Saka, she said with exasperated annoyance. Hama is one of us. She's from our tribe. If they couldn't trust someone from their tribe, being a tribe would lose all meaning. Then why didn't she go back after escaping the prison? He asked her. Why did she stay here? That's it. I've had enough of your stupid and baseless paranoia. She told her brother, starting a rant. Tomorrow morning, I am making Appa fly you back home where you can. Smack. The sound echoed through the shed. Aang, Tof, Appa, Momo, and even Akela were surprised and caught off guard at what just happened. Saka had simply walked to his sister and slapped her across the face. Katara, for once in your life, you are going to shut up and you are going to listen to your big brother, he told her with complete seriousness. She was too shocked at what happened to speak. It is true that I have been paranoid, I'm willing to admit that. But I've been paranoid because I have been worried about your safety and then the safety of this team. You seem to have gained the notion that every time I'm paranoid about something, I'm wrong. When I told you what I felt about Colonel Cheen, you ignore me and told me to grow up. When I made my feelings about Chia known repeatedly, you told me to stop being paranoid and I tried that. Look what happened both times. You led Colonel Chin to the colony, and if Naruto didn't risk his life to kill the colonel, everyone in Kozan would have been killed. Shuya turned out to be Naruto, and had you listened, we might have not lost Ba Sing Se. You need to get your head out of the clouds, Katara, and stay away from Hama. Hot tears of angry and humiliation fell from Katara's face. I am going to learn what Hama has to teach me, she told him. Once I'm done, I expect you to apologize before I have Appa send you home. She turned around and stomped out of the shed, slamming the door open. They left the undergarment store and kept on walking through the streets, looking at random things. Hey look, a new weapon store, Mai said, pointing at the store in question. Let's see what they got, Cory said, a little excited to see what they had. They walked in and started looking around. Hey Zuko, Temari said as she and the Prince of the Fire Nation looked at the swords. Have you ever thought of getting a new pair of Dao swords? I made the swords I have, Temari, he replied. Why would I throw them away? She just shrugged her shoulders in reply. Also, I have the distinct feeling if that I throw them, they'd get pissed. They'd get pissed? She asked, unsure if she had heard him right. Actually, it's singular, not plural, he amended. What are you talking about? I'm not sure, but I think that my swords are somehow sentient. Like there's a spirit living in them, he tried to explain. It sounded ridiculous, but it was the only way he could explain it. How can a sword be sentient? One word, Tamari, Samahada, Naruto said, having overheard them. Oh, good point. She had forgotten about that infamous sword. Cory was looking at lengths of chain for her spiked meteor hammer when she noticed something interesting. She was looking at a black leather belt. It was beautifully crafted, but they noticed the two holes in the side. That's good work right there, she noted getting everyone's attention. It's a prototype, the shop owner explained as he came over to them. The belt has dagger scabbards built into it. It might have a little extra weight, but you'll still be able to fight with it on. Why has no one bought it? Mai asked. Nobody really uses daggers around here. They've already got a sword, a pike, or fire bending. He walked away, going back to his store. Why don't you buy it, Mai? Kankaro suggested. You use daggers. I use knives, she told him pointedly. There is a difference. What about you, Azula? Cory asked the princess of the Fire Nation. You've trained with daggers. True, but father believes that I only need my fire bending, she explained. He knows that I've practiced with daggers, but that's it. He'll be furious if I bought something that had to do with daggers. While she talked, Zuko and Mai shared a look with each other and nodded. That's a pity, Tamari said. Let's keep going, Tylee said. They all walked out of the store and back onto the street. Katara was determined to prove her brother wrong, going with Hama to learn what she had to offer. They walked away from the village, so they could have privacy. 
They soon arrived at what appeared to be an open field, filled with small flowers and large patches of grass. Growing up in the South Pole, Hama began, waterbenders are totally at home surrounded by snow and ice and seas. But as you've probably noticed on your travels, this isn't the case wherever you go. I know, Katara agreed. When we were stranded in the desert, I felt like there was almost nothing I could do. She had never felt so helpless until then. That's why you have to learn to control water wherever it exists. I've even used my own sweat for waterbending, the young waterbender told the old waterbender. That's very resourceful, Katara, she praised the girl. You're thinking like a true master. But did you know you could even pull water out of thin air? She bent water out of the atmosphere and covered her fingers with it. You've got to keep an open mind, Katara, she said as the water froze, turning into ice and giving her claws. There's water in places you never think about. She hurled the claws at a tree and saw that they had struck the bark. Katara watched it all in amazement. This has got to be the nicest natural setting in the Fire Nation, Aang declared as he looked down at a river and the surrounding area. I don't see anything that would make a spirit mad around here. So it could be a human, Sokka pointed out as he stood by a tree with Akela at his side. Or maybe the moon spirit just turned mean, Tof suggested from where she stood next to Sokka and Akela. Tof, the moon spirit is a gentle, loving lady, the tribesman told the blind earthbender. She would never do something like this. And you would this how? She asked him. I knew her when she was still human. That was the only he was going to say. Thinking of you still hurt. Ng noticed a nearby villager walking by. Excuse me, sir, he said, running over to him. Can you tell us anything about the spirit that's been stealing people? Only one man ever saw it and lived, the villager answered after thinking it over. And that's old man Ding. Where does old man Ding live? Toph asked him, grabbing his arm to see if he was lying or not. Wow, Katara said as she and Hama walked through a field of flowers. These flowers are beautiful. They're called fire lilies, Hama told her. They only bloom a few weeks a year. But they're one of my favorite things about living here. And like all plants, and all living things, they're filled with water. I met a waterbender who lived in a swamp and could control the vines by bending the water inside. It had been one of the most impressive displays of waterbending she had ever seen. You can take even further. The old innkeeper spun in a circle, bending the water out of the flowers and then hurled it at a rock, cutting it to pieces. That was incredible! Katara exclaimed before looking down at the withered flowers. It's a shame about the lilies, though. They're just flowers, Hama said dismissively. When you're a waterbender in a strange land, you do what you must to survive. Tonight I'll teach you the ultimate technique of waterbending. It can only be done during the full moon when your bending is at its peak. But isn't that dangerous? She asked with concern. I thought people have been disappearing around here during the full moon. Oh, Katara. Two waterbender masters beneath a full moon. I don't think we have anything to worry about. She began to walk out of the field and Katara followed. All in all, Naruto and the others had a fun day out on the town. If they had been able to take a photo, they would have taken several. It was the kind of day that made it seem like there was nothing wrong with their lives. All they had to do was to have fun and be with their friends. But even the day had to obey one of the ancient laws of the universe. All good things must come to an end. That was great. Tai Li cheered as they walked back to the palace. Yeah, it was, Tamari agreed. Despite being a pack mule, I'd have to agree, Kankuro said. The stuff he was lugging was liable to put a cramp somewhere in his back. Stop complaining, Kankuro, she told her brother. I saw you at that puppet store. You were surrounded by teenager girls. You looked like you were enjoying yourself. Actually, I was trying to make sure I didn't make an ass of myself, he replied. If he had done so, the puppeteer corps would never let him live it down. What I found funny was that Gara was swarmed by little girls, Naruto said with laughter in his voice. You looked like a big, red-headed teddy bear, he told the Kazakage. It was kinda cute to watch, Tai Li admitted. The little girls had all but swarmed over him. But he handled them well and didn't favor one over the other. When it was time for him to leave, they almost had to pull him out of there. I thought of it as practice, Gara told them. Practice for what? Asked Mai. What could that have been practice for? For when I become a father. They were all surprised when they heard that. That hadn't been an answer they were expecting. So, you're planning to be the father of a horde of girls? You're going to have your work cut out for you, Gara, 
Naruto said, making the others laugh. But in all seriousness, I think you would make a great dad. Thanks, Naruto. I think you would too. That comment managed to make both Naruto and Azula blush at the same time. Nobody asked why Azula was blushing. They weren't that dense. Well, I know today was fun and all, Cory said, getting everyone's attention. I'd better go back to my room and pack. The mood felt somber. Everyone had just remembered that she was leaving. Come on, Cory, Azula said, placing her hand in the girl's shoulder. I'll help you pack. Thanks, Azula. The two of them walked away and the others dispersed, taking what they bought with them. Night had fallen at the village and mostly every villager who lived there were inside. Saka, Aang, Tof and Akela walked through the streets, looking for a specific person. Old man Ding? Asked Aang as they found the man they were looking for. The man turned towards them and swung his hammer, accidentally hitting his thumb. Dang blame it. He swore before looking at them. What? Can't you see I'm busy? We've got a full moon rising. And why does everyone call me that? I'm not that old. He tried to pick a board and failed. Well, I'm young at heart. Ng decided to help him with the board. Not ready to get snapped up by some moon monster yet at least. We wanted to ask you about that, Saka said as he picked up the hammer and started hammering in the nails. Did you get a good look at the spirit that took you? Ng asked the old man as they held the board in place on the window. Didn't see no spirit, just felt something come over me like I was possessed. Forced me to start walking toward the mountain, he pointed at said mountain. I tried to fight it, but I couldn't control my own limbs. It just about had me into a cave up there. And I looked up at the moon for what I thought would be my last glimpse of light. But then, the sun started to rise, and I got control of myself again. I just hightailed it away from that mountain as quick as I could. I don't think a spirit would take people to a mountain, Saka said. Oh no! exclaimed Tov suddenly. I did hear people screaming under the mountain. The missing villagers must still be there. They looked at the mountain and, without saying a word to old man Ding, sprinted towards it and then up it. I can hear them, she said after putting a hand on the ground when they were properly on the mountain. They're this way. They ran off into a different direction, the one where Tov was running towards. Can you feel the power the full moon brings? Hama asked Katara as they walked through the woods on the mountain. She stopped and inhaled through her nose. For generations, it has blessed waterbenders with its glow, allowing us to do incredible things. The veins in her arms bulged out, making Katara look at her with small surprise. I've never felt more alive. This is the place, Tof declared as they stopped in front of a cave. I can't see anything down there, Saka said. It just looked like a black hole leading into the mountain. That's why you have me. She grabbed his hand. Let's go. They jumped into the cave and went forward until they ran into a metal wall and door. Undeterred, she bent the metal door off its hinges and knocked it down. They ran down the tunnel with Aang and Saka carrying torches. They soon found the missing villagers, chained to columns. We're saved, one villager said. Tof got to work getting the people out of their chains, using her space rock to pick the locks. I didn't know a spirit made prisons like this, Aang noted. Who brought you here? He asked the villagers. It was no spirit, a woman said. It was a witch, a second villager agreed. A witch? Asked Saka, already getting a bad feeling. What do you mean? She seems like a normal old woman, but she controls people like some dark puppet master. The woman explained as Tof undid her shackles. He realized what she meant. Hama. Yes, the innkeeper. The first villager agreed. I knew it. I knew there was something off about her. Why didn't he act on it sooner? We have to stop Hama, Aang declared. I'll get these people out of here, Tof told the two of them. You go. Akela, stay with her. Saka told the wolf before handing his torch to the woman and running back down the tunnel with Aang. As a cat owl hooted and flew away, they faced the moon. What I'm about to show you, Hama told Katara. I discovered in that wretched Fire Nation prison. She could still remember what happened to her. The guards were always careful to keep any water away from us. They piped in dry air and had us suspended away from the ground. Before giving us any water, they would bind our hands and our feet so we couldn't bend. Any sign of trouble was met with cruel retribution. And yet each month, I felt the full moon enriching me with its energy. There had to be something I could do to escape. Then I realized that where there is life, there is water. 
The rats that scurried across the floor of my cage were nothing more than skins filled with liquid, and had passed years developing the skill that would lead to my escape. Bloodbending, what she said made Katara nervous. Controlling the water in another body, enforcing your own will over theirs, she remembered the years of practicing and developing the skill with perfect clarity. Once I had mastered the rats, I was ready for the men. And during the next full moon, I walked free for the first time in decades. My cell unlocked by the very guards assigned to keep me in. Once you perfect this technique, you can control anything or anyone. But to reach inside someone and control them? Katara asked. I don't know if I want that power. It sounded wrong, so very wrong. The choice is not yours, Hama told her. The power exists. And it's your duty to use the gifts you've been given to win this war. Katara, they tried to wipe us out, our entire culture, your mother. I know. Spirits, did she know? But it still sounded wrong. Then you should understand what I'm talking about. We're the last two waterbenders of the southern tribe. We have to fight these people whenever we can, wherever they are, with any means necessary. That was when she realized that Sokka had been right the entire time. It's you, you're the one who's been making people disappear during the full moons. They threw me in prison to rot, along with my brothers and sisters. She stated, a crazed look beginning to form on her face. They deserve the same. You must carry on my work. I won't. I won't use bloodbending and I won't allow you to keep terrorizing this town. Katara declared, pointing her finger at her. Suddenly, her arm twisted around. She tried to stop it, but it didn't work. You should have learned the technique before you turned against me. Hama made her stand stiff. It's impossible to fight your way out of my grip. I control every muscle, every vein in your body. She began to play around, treating Katara like she was a puppet. Stop, please, she begged as she was forced to her knees with tears in her eyes. Hama only cackled in response. The cackling stopped as Katara forced herself to stand up again, the tears disappearing. You're not the only one who draws power from the moon. My bending is more powerful than yours, Hama. Your technique is useless against me, she declared. She drew water from the ground and threw it at Hama, who returned it. This went on for a few more times before Hama bent the water out of two trees behind her, which shattered the trees, deflected the attack from Katara and sent it at her. She simply slammed her palm against it, shattering it into droplets, surprising Hama. She took advantage of the surprise by using her waterbending to knock the old innkeeper down to the ground. As she stood up again, Saka and Aang appeared out of the forest behind her. We know what you've been doing, Hama, Saka told her. Give up, Aang ordered her as he took a stance. You're outnumbered. No, she replied, standing up from where she fell. You've outnumbered yourselves. She took control of them both, making them go stiff as a board, and sent them at Katara. She dodged them and bent water at Hama. Her response was to bend the water out of another tree, destroying it, and bend it into a wheel of water, blocking her attack. Katara, look out! Sokka told her as he unwillingly stood back up and drew his jin. He swung wildly at her, forcing her back. She knocked him aside with water she bent out of the ground. This feels weird. Ng declared as he was forced to attack her. She used her water to knock him up against the tree and then froze him there. I'm sorry, Aang. She apologized. It's okay. He assured her. Sokka came back at her, forcing her to destroy a tree by bending the water out of it and knocking him against another tree, freezing his sword hand against it. Don't hurt your friends, Katara. Hama mocked the young waterbender. And don't let them hurt each other. She bent them out of the ice and hurled them at each other. No. She cried as Sokka's jian was about to pierce Aang. They suddenly stopped and had control over themselves. Hama, however, suddenly stiffened. Katara had no other choice. To save her brother and her friend, she had been forced to use bloodbending on Hama. As the old innkeeper was forced to her knees, everyone heard a howl of a wolf in the air. Looks like Tof brought a few friends, Sokka remarked as Tof, Akela and the missing villagers arrived. Hama was soon clasped in irons. You're going to be locked away forever, one villager declared. My work is done, Hama said before looking back at Katara. Congratulations, Katara, you're a bloodbender. She cackled as she was taken away. Katara fell to the ground, crying. Both Aang and Sokka knelt beside her to give her comfort. I'm sorry, Sokka, she sobbed. I'm sorry. It's okay, 
Katara, he told her. Now wasn't the time to tell her he told her so. He had to be a big brother. No, it's not, she said, the tears still falling. You told me the truth and I blew you off, like I always did. I could have seriously hurt someone because of my pride. You and Aang nearly died because I was so arrogant. It's over, Katara. He gave her a hug. She's gone and she won't be able to hurt anyone where she's going. But it's still my fault. And it would haunt her for the rest of her life. She had nearly killed her own friends and family because of what happened. Azula walked down a corridor, going to her room. It had been a long, fun-filled day and she was tired. Where's your friend? Yao Jing asked her, standing against a nearby wall. That colony trash, where's she at? Cory is not trash, Yao Jing, she replied, turning to face her. You would do well to remember that. You still haven't answered my question. Where is she? Why do you even care? The last time she had checked, her bastard sister didn't even want to be in the same room as Cory. You're not really interested in the friends I make. I'm curious. She left. She went back home. That's a pity. I was hoping to get to know her better. Her hands covered themselves in blue flames when she heard that comment. You touch her, you even look at her, and I'll... You'll what? Yao Jing asked with a smug smirk on her face, knowing that she had her little sister. I'll burn your photo of Chun. The princess of the Fire Nation threatened her, only to be suddenly slammed into the wall behind her. Her sister held her there by her neck and was slowly choking her. You do that, and I will give you a slow, horrible death. She snarled. Her eyes were furious and scared. She was scared that the photo would be destroyed. If I were you, Yao Jing, Naruto said from behind her, the sound of a jian being drawn echoing through the corridor. I would let her go unless you want your head flying through the air without your body attached. She let Azula go, letting her fall to the ground. She started to walk away when Azula spoke out, making her stop. Do you wish you had more time to spend with her? Or so you could get to know her more? She asked her sister as Naruto helped her up. It doesn't matter and it's none of your business, she told them without turning to face them. She walked away, soon disappearing. Do you really need to antagonize her, Azula? Naruto asked as he put the Jien away. She threatened Kori, she answered as they walked through the hallways to her room. So, you threatened her with Chun's photo? After what they had learned, that was probably not a good idea. It was the only thing I knew that would get to her, the princess of the Fire Nation replied. I didn't think the reaction would be that extreme. Did you forget our conversation this morning? You know the one about the maid? I'm sorry, okay. They fell silent as they entered her room. Before she did anything else, she turned to face her bodyguard. What's wrong, Naruto? He stayed at the door. Why was that letter a forgery? She instantly froze when she heard that question. W what are you talking about? I'm not an idiot, Azula, he told her. I know you forged that letter from Mr. Morishida. Now I want to know why. Because, she tried to say it, but was having a hard time. Because, he repeated the word, albeit as a question. She summoned up her courage and finished what she was going to say. I was trying to protect her. You heard what Yao Jing said and you know what she meant. I wasn't about to let Cory be in trouble because of family politics. I knew that the safest place for her to be right now is at Yudao, at her home. Why didn't you just tell her to leave? He had thought the two of them were friends. She had been looking forward to this trip and I didn't want to hurt her feelings by making her leave early. I also didn't want her to hate me. That would have hurt her even more than what she had done, she was sure of it. So, you made that letter? To protect her from my family, she said with complete seriousness. And, well, to protect her from the other thing as well. They both knew what the other thing was, but did not speak of it. I see, Naruto said. You did this to protect a friend. Yes, I did. So, you finally managed to find your answer. She nodded. It took me a while. I couldn't really figure it out until after what happened to us in Ba Sing Se. Then it came to me, and I slowly began to figure it out. I finally got it after Ember Island and after I met Chun. So, what is your answer? He knew that she knew it, but he wanted to hear her say it. She took a deep breath and looked him straight in the eye. My friends and my family are important to me. If anyone harms them, that person will know suffering and pain, she vowed. He smiled. I see. Then it's a good thing I sent a messenger hawk to Mr. Morishida, explaining what you did and asking him to play along. 
He turned around and started to walk away, only to stop and turn around again. Azula, if you consider family important, then will you still follow your father? Leave that to me, she told him, turning to face her room. I'll handle that when the time comes. As you wish. He bowed to her. Good night, Azula. Good night, Naruto. She heard the door close behind her. Yeah, I'll handle it, she muttered to herself with a bit of self-mocking. Like it'll be that easy. Chapter 27, Insomnia and Gifts, Location, Fire Nation. They pushed their way out of the bushes to see koala sheep sleeping the grass. This is it, Sokka said as he looked at the map. The official rendezvous point for the invasion force. How did you pick this place? Toe fast him. All she could see were grassy plains right next to cliffs. Before we split up, my dad and I found this island on the map, he explained. It's uninhabited, and the harbor surrounded by cliffs seemed like the perfect secluded place. Nice choice, Sokka, Katara told her brother as they set up camp. And we're here four days ahead of schedule. They had a few days to relax before things became serious again. Wait, four days? Ng asked, leaping up into the air and freaking out. The invasion is in four days? Sokka yawned. That's four days from now. Relax, saying. He went to sleep the minute his head hit the sleeping bag. Akela slept next to him. Sokka's got the right idea, Aang, Katara said to the air nomad. We're here. We're ready. The best thing we can do now is get plenty of rest. She lay down on her sleeping bag and followed her brother's example. I guess he agreed reluctantly. He lay down on the ground and tried to go to sleep. The doors to the throne room were knocked down and Aang came in with a large amount of hair, a headband, and a yellow jumpsuit. Your days of tyranny are over, fire lord, he declared, doing poses that would have made any of the Kanoha eleven slap him across the face. I'm bringing you down. The supposed fire lord, who looked nothing like the actual fire lord, put the bundle of grapes he was about to eat and looked at him. Really? he asked. How do you plan on doing that when you're not even wearing pants? He looked down. Sure enough, there were no pants. Oh no! He cried, pulling a cover with the air nomad symbol on it out of thin air. Eyeballs began to appear out of nowhere and looked at him before disappearing. Not having pants isn't your biggest concern right now, a voice from behind him said. He turned around and saw Naruto, Jien out and ready to use. That would be me. Before Aang could say anything, he flew towards the pantsless airbender, swinging his Jien. He awoke with a gasp and furiously checked his pants, making sure they were still there. His actions woke up the resident lemur. It was just a dream, Momo, he said with relief. I still have my pants. He stood up. Well, I'd better keep training. He walked and started his training, which was basically kicking a bush repeatedly. Momo just went back to sleep. Azula was awake but was planning on not opening her eyes. She was planning on staying one with her bed. That is, until her sixth sense went off and she rolled off the bed to avoid a knife flying at her. I hate you, Naruto, she growled from the other side of the bed. No, you don't, he replied with a grin from where he stood against the door. Besides, I had to wake you up somehow. You couldn't have just shaken me awake? That would have been a much better alternative to knives. Why would I do that when I can train you at the same time? He walked over to her closet and pulled out some of her clothes. He put them on the bed went back to the door, and waited, facing the hallway. Azula glared at him briefly before started to change. She could still remember the first time she woke up and there were no servants waiting on her. Naruto had told the servants not to come into her room to dress her. She had yelled at him, demanding who was going to dress her. You have arms and hands, he had told her with a calm voice that she had found infuriating. I assumed you knew how to use them. From that day on, she had dressed herself. She hated doing it at first, but had eventually grown used to it. When Naruto offered to have the servants come back, she said no. When she had finished dressing herself, she looked over at the door. I'm done, she told Naruto. Good to know, he answered, turning to face her. What do you want to do before the party? She thought it over and shrugged. Let's see how Zuko is doing. Lead the way. Katara, Saka, and Tof woke to the sounds of Aang punching a tree, repeatedly. Hey, how long have you been up? Katara asked, walking over to him. A couple hours, he answered as he circled the tree, hitting it as he went. I got a lot more skills to refine if I'm gonna fight Ozai. He stopped and started to pant. 
You know, there is such a thing as overtraining, she remarked. He didn't listen to what she said, he just punched the tree. It made him fall and had all the leaves fall out of the tree on top of him. This made the others look at what was going on. Tof was looking in a different direction. You don't get it, do you? He asked Katara as he got out of the leaves and began to circle her. My form is bad. I'm sloppy and I still don't know any fire bending. Not even the basics. His left eye was twitching as he said those last words. The eclipse will block off the fire bending, Aang, Sokka pointed out to him. You don't need to know it. That plus the fire lord being completely powerless gave the advantage to them. Okay, well I still have to work on everything else. I'd better spend the whole day training. He quickly bowed to both Sokka and Katara before running off on an air ball. This will go on for a while, won't it? Sokka asked his sister. I hope not, she replied. I hear that. But now I have to do something that's probably going to take most of the day. What's that? Tofast? He turned to face Akela, who was still covered in black suit. Time to give you a bath, he announced. That was one of the few times the members of Team Avatar saw the wolf cringe and have his tail droop between his legs. Akela, don't make this harder than it has to be, the tribesman said warningly as the wolf began to back away. You were the one who jumped into the soot. You knew this was gonna happen. The wolf still tried to run but didn't get far due to the fact Sokka had leapt for him and wrestled him to the ground. It took the combined efforts of Katara, Tof and Sokka to give the wolf a bath. He kept struggling to escape and had almost succeeded twice. By the time they were done, it was time for lunch. Akela's fur was now white again, but he kept glaring at everybody. He finally forgave them when everyone was going to sleep. That was when Aang reappeared. He walked back into camp, yawned and fell to the ground. Good night, Katara, he said. Good night, Sokka. Good night, Tof. Good night, Appa. Good night, Momo. Good night, Akela. Good night, Appa and Mo. Go to sleep already. Tof yelled at him. He flinched but followed her instructions. The doors were knocked and Aang stood before them. He snapped his fingers and smoke began to pour in. He ran in and stood before the Fire Lord. Your days of tyranny are over, Fire Lord. I'm bringing you down. He looked down for a brief moment. And this time I brought pants. He had indeed brought pants. They were covered in chains and locks. So, it seems, the Fire Lord remarked. But are you prepared for your mathematics test? A giant abacus slammed into the ground behind Aang. Math test? He repeated in stunned horror. Oh no! I forgot all about the math test. Well, here it is, Naruto said from above. He looked up and all he saw was a Jien coming down at him. He came awake with a gasp. I gotta be ready, he declared. He got up, walked away from the camp and began training again. This time, he circled a group of sleeping koala sheep. However, his noise woke Katara, and she came over. Aang, it's the middle of the night, she told him. You need to go back to sleep. But I forgot my pants and my math test, he replied, making her confused for a moment. She took a deep breath and stopped him. Aang, sleep, she told him. Please, for me. He looked at her. He had bags under his eyes, showing how long he had going without sleep. He nodded in agreement, and she led him back to the camp. Azula knocked on her brother's door. What is it, Azula? He asked, opening the door. He was dressed for the day but looked like he hadn't left his room yet. I was wondering if I could get a look at my present, she said with an innocent smile on her face. While that smile might have fooled a stranger, it did not fool him. No. You'll get it at the party tonight. So, there is a present, she said, the innocent smile disappearing for a triumphant one. Of course there is. It's your birthday. You thought I wouldn't get you a present? He was right, of course. It was Azula's fifteenth birthday, and he made sure to get her a present. That's good to know, Naruto said from where he stood behind the birthday girl. The one problem I've got is that war meeting. Let it go already, Naruto, Azula told him without turning to face him. He knows today's your birthday and yet, he's still having the meeting. If the blonde had a scale of rude things the Fire Lord did, that ranked high. Wait, what meeting? Zuko asked, confused by what they were saying. The Fire Paragon looked at him. You mean you didn't hear? He asked. Your father decided to have an important war meeting today. The Scarred Dragon was surprised by that piece of news. Why haven't I heard of this meeting? I didn't get an invitation. 
probably because it's so obvious that you should be there, Azula told him, making it sound like she was speaking to an idiot. Azula, be nice, Naruto told her before looking at Zuko again. The meeting's in about a half hour. Why so early? He's not completely inconsiderate. He gestured at Azula. So, will you go, now that you know? The Prince of the Fire Nation thought it over for a moment. The last time I showed myself uninvited to a war meeting, I got myself in trouble. If my father wants me to be there, I'll gladly go. Until then, I'll just stay out of the way. You're sure? The blonde asked. Yes. All right, we'll go now. He and Azula walked away from his door, leaving him alone. I'm surprised, she said as they walked through the halls. I thought he would have started acting like a child when he heard about it. He's grown up, Azula, he replied. He's trying to learn restraint. If he wasn't invited, then he'll accept it. But we both know that father wants him there. It might not have been official, but Zuko was battle-tested and achieved victory. For her father not to have him there would have been stupidity. So, he'll send a messenger to get him, Naruto replied. He knew that the royal flaming asshole would not want to look inconsiderate and stupid to his generals. Wake up, Aang, he heard someone say. Wake up, sleepyhead. He opened his eyes and saw the actual fire lord Ozai standing over him. Rise and shine. You overslept. You missed the invasion. The fire lord began to laugh and that was when Aang realized he was riding a flying hippo cow that could breathe fire. He woke up fast. Saka, get up. I need to know what day it is. He shouted at the sleeping water paragon. What? Who's talking? Saka asked as he woke up, his hand going for his jian and drawing it. Realizing he wasn't in any danger, he put it back and tried to go back to sleep. Relax? It's still two days before the invasion, Tof said grouchily as she and Katara woke up. The blind earthbender was tired and being woken up like this wasn't helping. Saka, you've got to get up and drill your rock climbing exercises, Aang said, trying to get the tribesmen up. What? He asked, unsure of what he had just heard. In one of my dreams, you were running from Fire Nation soldiers, trying to climb this cliff, but you were too slow, and they caught you. The air nomad explained in a half-panicked voice. That was just a dream, Aang. I'm a good climber, Sokka tried to reassure him, not moving from where he laid. Then climb that cliff. Climb it fast. Aang pointed at a nearby cliff, trying to get his friend to move. No. The sleep-depraved avatar turned around and saw Tof about to drink something. Don't drink that. He shouted at her. She spat it out, hitting Katara with it. Why? Is it poison? She asked while Katara bent the water off. In my dream, we were right in the middle of the invasion, and you had to stop to the bathroom. We died because of your tiny bladder. And you need to start wearing your hair up, he told Katara. In my dream, your hair got caught in a train and O.W. He said that last part because Sokka had hit him across the back of his head. Would you calm down? Sokka asked him. This was really getting old. Aang, I know you're just trying to help, but you really need to get a grip. You're unraveling, Katara told him, trying to be reassuring. He took a deep breath to calm down. You're right. I'm losing my mind. He began to pace around the camp, his eye twitching while he played with his fingers. It's like every time I think about how stressed I am, I just end up more stressed. I'm like a big growing snowball of nerves, he finally said after doing that for about twenty minutes or so. Of course, you are, Saka said, looking up from the piece of armor he had started working on for Akela. That's cause you gotta fight the Fire Lord, one of the evilest people on this planet. If you don't win, we're done for. Saka, you're not helping, Katara told her brother. It was this kind of thing that would just make Aang more stressed. What? It's true. That's the deal. He knows it. He stood up as he talked to her. She tried to force him to sit down again, but he swatted her hand away and glared at her. She looked away and walked over to Aang, who was getting more nervous. You know what? She said to him. I've got just the thing. Get ready to be de-stressed. She led him to a hot spring underneath the ground. These yoga stretches can really work wonders if you do them in extreme heat. Reach up. She placed her hands together and stretched them over her head. Reach for the sun. He followed her example. Feel your chi pads clearing. They stretch side to side before bending down and touching their heads to the ground. Now close your eyes. How are you feeling? I feel really warm, he told her. 
Good, good. Go on. Like there's this warm feeling all around me. This heat, like I'm in the Fire Lord's palace, and he's shooting a bunch of fireballs at me. And the whole world is being engulfed in flames. He began to freak out again. Maybe your stress is the kind you need to talk out, she suggested. This led to him having somewhat of a therapy session with Sokka. So what is bothering you? Sokka asked him as he rested his head on a koala sheep. The tribesmen sat on the grass nearby while Akela lay next to him. You know what's been bothering me, the air nomad replied. I have to face the fire lord in a few days. But why are you so afraid of him? You said it yourself? He's the evilest person on the planet. I said that he's one of the evilest people in the world. There's never just one evil person, there are always more. That was something he had learned, and it made him scared. Well, I'm supposed to face this one and save the world. Aang exclaimed, focusing on the present rather than the future. Actually, it's more like just this side of the planet, the tribesmen remarked. They didn't even know what was going on in the elemental countries, aside from the two cloaked figures who appeared in Kozan. Okay, but what can I do to feel better? Want to try screaming into this? He offered the avatar a koala sheep. He took it and screamed into the fur. Didn't work? The water paragon asked him. What do you think? He said as he handed the koala sheep back. The meeting was over. Sure enough, Naruto had been right. Ozai had sent Zuko's servant, Ha, to get him. So, how did it go? Mai asked Zuko as he exited the chambers. He had told her about the meeting just as Ha had arrived to get him. When I got to the meeting, everyone welcomed me, he said in a slightly surprised voice as they walked away. My father had saved me a seat. He wanted me next to him. I was literally at his right hand. Zuko, that's wonderful, she told him. You must be happy. They stopped and stared at a painting of Ozai. During the meeting, I was the perfect prince, he said, looking at the painting. The son my father wanted. But I wasn't me. And that had scared him. He was beginning to feel like he didn't know who he was anymore. She gave him a hug. Don't let it get to you. She let go of him. Come on, we still have a birthday to attend to. He smiled as they walked away. As they did, Azula and Naruto came out of the chambers. I cannot believe you said that to him. Azula said to her bodyguard as they walked away. It had to be said, he replied, like what had happened was nothing important. You threatened the Fire Lord in his own war meeting. She almost shouted at him, furious at the unusual behavior he displayed at the meeting. It wasn't a threat. It was a warning. And it was one he intended to keep. But did you have to make it in front of everyone? Yes, he answered firmly. We both know that he's been thinking about it ever since I came here. If I hadn't warned him, he might have actually tried to do it. Think of the two men who came after me in Kozan. Azula nodded as she recalled Itachi and Kisame at Kozan, brazenly announcing in front of both armies that they were after the blonde paragon. Now multiply that by a thousand, Naruto continued. The shinobi who tried to drag me back are at half of their peak strength. If the Fire Lord had carried out the invasion of the elemental nations, the Fire Nation army would find themselves in a war of attrition that they cannot win. It would be like trying to conquer Ba Sing Se for a good chunk of your childhood. It will take a long time, and the price of the victory wouldn't be worth it. I guess you're right. She gave a small smile. Although I will admit that seeing Yao Jing flabbergasted at what you said was a perk. I'm glad I made you happy. He looked back at the chamber entrance, which still had people coming out of it. Let's go. We don't want to stay around and have a polite conversation with Yao Jing or the royal flaming asshole. Do you have to keep calling him that? She asked with exasperation. That was her father he was talking about. It's a habit, and one I'm not willing to drop. All right, Tove said to the air nomad. What you need is a good old-fashioned back pounding to relieve yourself. Pound away, Aang told her. He was lying on a bed of pillars. She began to stomp on the ground bending the pillars to randomly pound into his back. Ah. Ow. Oh. Ah. Tof, I think this is bruising me. She stopped pounding, but he literally vibrated off the bed. Sorry, I forgot you have baby skin. She apologized as he sat back up. Well, there's one other thing we can try. She stomped on the ground again, and something in the distance flew into the air and landed in her hand. Acupuncture, she declared with a big grin, holding a porcupine in her hand. When Aang heard that and saw the animal in her hand, his legs suddenly found strength again. 
He decided to do what any sane person would do when offered by a blind girl to have sharp, pointy things stuck in their body. He ran away screaming. The birthday party had gotten underway, and it was in full swing. People were still coming into the ballroom and offering their congratulations to the birthday girl. This is starting to become annoying, she muttered as she stood where everyone could see her and go to meet her. What do you mean starting? My asked beside her. It's not even my birthday, and I feel like I want to kill somebody. Uh, my, you feel like that every time someone is annoying you, Kankuro said. I beg your pardon? She asked, her hand reaching for one of her hidden knives. My, could you please not kill my brother? Tamari asked her. We still need him, despite how idiotic he acts sometimes. Hey, I'm not the only one who's done that. He retorted. She had her moments of idiocy as well. Knock it off, you two, Gara told them without even looking at them. We're in the middle of a party. To have a fight start between siblings in the middle of a party such as this would make them seem quite rude. Sorry, Gara, the two apologized. They were representing the land of wind and Sunagakir here at the party. It would not do to start fight. Personally, I just hope that they don't bring boys to meet you and offer wedding proposals, Tylee stated, standing on the other side of Azula. I think I'd be sick just watching them try to impress you. That's not going to happen, Naruto and Zuko said at the same time, making the group look at them. What did you do? Azula demanded with a scowl. She knew they had done something. They shared a look before shrugging in unison. We might have gone to all the noble houses that had teenage sons a couple of days beforehand, Zuko admitted. And we may or may not have threatened them with horrifying deaths if they even thought of proposing to you, Naruto said. He looked at Zuko. Which threats did we use again? Let's see. He thought it over. There was being slowly burned alive. Right, I remember that one. We also used suddenly being drafted. There was the threat of being decapitated with a small, rusty knife. Did we use getting lost at sea? The blonde asked. Yes, and being stampeded by Komodo rhinos. Okay, we get it, my said, interrupting them. They used a very number of threats on any teenage boys to keep them from proposing marriage. And why exactly did you feel the need to do that? Azula asked them, being extremely annoyed with both her brother and her bodyguard. I could have handled them myself. Actually, it was more along the lines of so we wouldn't have to hear them trying to get you to like them. We agreed that your birthday party should not be a bloodbath, Zuko explained. Thank you for your consideration, she told her brother with obvious sarcasm. Besides, the only way any boy would be able to court me is if they defeated me in an Agni Kai. Um, going by that statement, Naruto said, his cheeks blushing, the only person who'd be able to marry you is me. This made Azula also blush and made them avoid eye contact. The rest of the group shared a silent groan. Will these two just admit their feelings already? They thought in unison. This is getting pathetic. Tylee saw someone in the crowd. Quick, hide me. She cried, leaping behind Azula's back. Tylee? What's wrong? Mai asked her friend. She had never really seen the acrobat act like that. It's my mother and sisters, they're coming this way. She said in a half-panicked voice. Everyone who knew what that meant quickly started looking around for the people in question. Form a line. Azula ordered the group in a whisper when she found them. They all quickly got into a line to hide Tylee. It was just in time, too. Princess Azula, my congratulations to you, Tylee's mother said as she and the Tylee lookalike stood in front of her. I beg your pardon, princess, but have you seen my daughter? I see six of them, she answered with a dry sarcasm, looking at the six lookalikes of Tylee. Tylee, your highness? We haven't seen her since she's come back. She's been living with us, she said like it was the most obvious thing. But where is she now? Lookalike number one asked her. Yeah, we thought she would have been here. Lookalike number four said. I think she said something about going back to the circus, Naruto told them. He was trying to get them to leave, but it looked like they weren't getting the hint. Lookalike number six snorted. That's just like Tylee. She could have done something respectable. Instead, she joined the circus. Lookalike number three finished. Could she do anything worse? The blonde glared at them. Be glad we're in the middle of a party, otherwise I would have clocked you both upside the head for that insult. He threatened the two of them. I'm half tempted to let him, Azula remarked. Their mother understood the threat. Apologize, you two, she snapped at them. Sorry, they apologized, but their faces didn't show a single iota of remorse. 
Come on, mom, lookalike number two said. It's obvious she's not here. I'm sorry for taking up your time, your highness, the mother and the lookalikes bowed and then walked away. Some friend she is, lookalike number five muttered, loud enough for them to hear her. Are, are they gone? Tylee asked from behind Azula. Yes, they've left the party, Azula told her, seeing the lookalikes and their mother leaving the ballroom. I guess they just wanted to find you. Sorry guys, she apologized. They've been trying to get me to come back and find a husband. They want you to come back just for that? Tamari repeated, incredulous. Assholes, Kankuro swore, throwing a glare at the exit where they had left. If I tried to skewer them to the wall with a knife, would you guys try to stop me? Mai asked the rest of the group. Her expression was murderous, and her fingers itched to grab a knife handle. Are you kidding? Tamari asked back. I'd give you the knife. Same here, Kankuro agreed. I could hold them down if you want, Naruto offered. I would help, Gara said. I can see why you left for the circus now, he told Tai Li. It has done wonders for you. You really think so? She asked, not sure if he meant it or not. Of course I did, Naruto reassured her. She was better off now, being away from her mother and sisters. Night had fallen again, and everyone was pretty much ready to go to sleep. Thanks for everything. Guy Zang said as he sat on the ground and held his legs. So, do you feel less stressed? Katara asked him. Ready for a good night's sleep? Uh, I kinda think I sorta might feel slightly feel a little better. Maybe, he offered a little weakly. I guess we're good then, Sokka declared before yawning and laying his head to rest. Both Katara and Toph followed his example. Ink put his down on the ground and closed his eyes. This dream came and went in flashes. First, he was steering Appa through a storm while avoiding a giant Momo. Then he found himself in the Fire Nation Royal Palace. He saw Toph, who had no eyes, disappearing into the ground before him. He saw Sokka trying to run away, only to be smothered by the earth. He saw Katara surrounded by flames. He went to go help her, but his feet were frozen. The eyes spread to his entire body, holding him in place. A fire had taken the shape of Ozai and started laughing. The heat melted the ice and made him fall into water. As he sank, he hit bottom and the world flipped over. The bottom of the water became the layer of ice that trapped him. As he looked through the ice, he saw Zuko standing above him, the comet flying through the sky. Then he found himself standing on a small hill, looking out at a green field with mountains in the background. The comet crashed into the ground and turned everything into a scarred wasteland. As he looked on, he felt a giant burst of pain. He looked down and saw Jien sticking out of his chest, blood dripping from the blade. This has all happened because of you, Naruto's voice whispered in his ear. You should not exist, Avatar. He woke up screaming that woke up everyone, even Appa. What happened, Aang? Katara asked him as she, Toph, and Sokka ran over to him. It's the nightmares. He told them. They just keep getting worse and worse. Do we need to talk again? Sokka asked him. No, that won't help. Nothing helps. There's only one thing I can do. I'm going to stay awake straight through the invasion. He started to shake and twitched, making the others look at him like he had lost his mind. Toph just smiled. Knowing there was nothing they could say that would change his mind, all they could was go back to sleep. The next morning, as Katara stood on a cliff face and stretched, he was walking around behind her. Invasion, he muttered. All aboard for the invasion. You don't look so good, she told him, walking over to him. You sure you can't just lie down for a little nap? I told you, I can't go back to sleep, he replied, turning to face her. Why couldn't she see that? Aang, staying up all night can't be good for you. If anything, it was probably very, very bad for you. Actually, staying up all night has given me time to think. And I've realized some big things, Katara. He looked out at the sea. What big things? She asked him taking a few steps forward. I see everything so clearly now. What really matters, and why I'm really doing this. He turned back to face her. I'm doing this to save the world. But more than that, I'm doing for the people I love. He walked right up to her. I'm doing it for you, Katara. Aang, what are you saying? I'm saying, I love you. He kissed her. After being caught off guard, she smiled and returned the kiss. What are we doing? She asked in a whisper, breaking the kiss. What our hearts have been telling us to do for a long, long time. Baby. 
He dipped her. You're my forever girl. He puckered up for another kiss. Aang. Her voice snapped him out of the daydream he was having. I was just saying you should take a nap. Oh, I guess I kinda drifted into a daydream, he told her, quickly turning back to face her. What was your dream about? Um, living underwater? He said, although he made it sound like a question. Sounds neat. She walked away as he chuckled nervously. Once she was away, he breathed a sigh of relief. That had been a little too close. After everyone had given their congratulations to Azula, it was decided to give the presents. Each family came up to as she sat at the head of the table, Naruto standing at her side. Many gave her a present that was something she didn't want or need. Her father wasn't one to give her a present, she had been expecting that, and neither was Yao Jing, she figured that, if anything, her bastard sister would somehow turn the present into something that'll kill her. Which was why her friends decided to go last in the giving of presents, that way, she had something to look forward. After the last family had given her their present, a gem that had been in their family for ten generations, a servant stepped forward, holding a roll of paper. Princess Azula, your friend, the Lady Cory, had left this for you. She said that she was sad that she could not give to you personally. He unraveled the paper and showed it to her, and to the crowd. It was a painting, done in color, of Cory, Azula, Mai, and Tylee. It had been when they were in Udao. They decided to relax one afternoon in the mayor's garden. As they lounged around, a nearby artist was trying to find inspiration. He saw them and asked them if he could paint them. They agreed and he got to work. He didn't have them pose. He wanted them to go on as they were. Once he was done, he thanked them and left. Before she had left for the capital, Cory had tracked down the artist and asked if she could have the painting. He happily gave it to her once she explained it was for the princess's birthday. The painting showed them lounging in front of a large tree. Tai Li was sitting on her elbows as she watched the game of Pai show that both Azula and Cory were playing. Mai was sitting opposite of Tai Li and was fiddling with a small knife. Azula and Cory were sitting on opposite sides of the Pai show table. Both managed to look focused and relaxed at the same time as they focused on the game in front of them. Azula's arms were crossed, while Cory's right hand hovered above a pie show piece, deciding whether to move it or not. It is a magnificent piece of work, Azula declared as she looked at the painting, remembering that day. I wish Cory could be here, so I could thank her in person for this gift. The servant bowed, rolled up the painting carefully and walked away. The sand siblings stepped forward. Princess Azula, Gara began. Our gift to you is this. He offered a small statuette of Azula's mother, Ursa, made from sandstone. We know that your mother has disappeared, but we hoped that this would give you a small amount of comfort, and would also help you remember her. She reached out and took the statue hesitantly. Ursa's hands were folded together. Her stance was regal, but not cold or rigid. She wore a small smile on her face. As Azula held the statue, the smile seemed to speak of her love and care for both of her children. Thank you, she told the sand siblings. I will treasure this, for it does remind me of my mother. She handed the statuette to a servant, who carried it away. The sand siblings stepped away and Tai Li walked forward. This is my gift to you, Azula. She offered a pair of gloves. I helped make them. It's made from the finest leather in the Fire Nation. She took the gloves and looked closer at them. They were made of black leather and were fingerless. There were holes where her knuckles would go and an open space on the back. The ends would be held closed by use of a button. Thank you, Tai Li. She tried on the gloves, flexing her fingers to get a feel for them. These are quite striking and are also useful. The acrobat lit up with a brilliant smile. Knowing that hugging her friend right now would have been frowned on, she bowed and walked away. Mai walked forward. My gift to you, Azula, is this. She held a belt, but it wasn't just any belt. It was the belt from the weapon store, the prototype. I saw you making eyes at it and figured you might want it. Both Azula and Naruto smirked as she took the belt. They knew that if she had bought the belt herself, Ozai would have been furious. But if she had gotten it as a gift, there was nothing he could do. Thank you, Mai. I thought you would have brought some daggers with it as well. Mai didn't say anything. She simply stepped aside. Suko stepped forward, the last in the line. This is my gift to you, Azula, he said. He held a small pillow in his hands and on the pillow rested two identical daggers. I forged them myself from you down metal. Well, forged one and reforged the other. She took the daggers and looked at them. 
The blades were straight and double-edged, so one could slash with either edge. Their handles were black and made of leather. They had a cross guard made of simple metal. She then noticed an inscription on one of them. Never give up without a fight, she whispered, realizing where that dagger had come from. It was the dagger that Zuko had gotten when Iroh had broken through the outer wall of Ba Sing Se. It was the dagger that she wanted herself. Now, he was giving it to her as a gift, of his own free will. Then she noticed that the other dagger held an inscription as well. Always remember lesson number three, she read quietly. She looked quickly at her bodyguard, who gave her a wink. Thank you, Zuko, she said aloud as she placed the daggers in the belts built in scabbards. I will be sure to cherish this gift. She stood up and faced the crowd. I thank you for your gifts, she announced to them. Ozai also rose. Now let us eat. He clapped his hands once as everyone gathered around the tables. Bring in the feast. The doors to the ballroom opened and servants carrying the food came in. Aang was hiding in a bush, waiting in ambush. He leapt out into the open and rolled behind a rock. Put him up, fire lord, he declared. His opponent was a tree with a picture he made from noodles and a target beneath it. He leapt into the air and bent a couple of blasts of air at the target. They flew overhead and hit Sokka, knocking him down. Hey, I'm trying to build up a some armor here so he doesn't have to go into the invasion naked, he told the sleep-deprived airbender. He's your bison. Ozai's defense is impeccable, he said, ignoring Sokka. I'll have to try a different approach. He leapt into the air and threw about four punches of air at the tree. When he landed, he found out that he had missed all four times. You think you're untouchable, don't you, Mr. Fire Lord? He accused the tree. Boy, you are really starting to lose it, kid, said a voice from behind him. He turned around and saw Momo. Momo, did you hear something? He asked before turning to check around him. No, but I said something. He turned to face the lemur and saw that was him who was talking. You, my friend, are just a few plums short of fruit pie, Momo told him. He took a step back, shook his head and covered his eyes with his hands. When he opened them again, the lemur was speaking in his normal chitter. That's more like it, he said, briefly patting Momo's head. I'm so tried that for a second there, I imagined you were talking to me. The lemur just cocked his head. Oh, Momo, let me explain. He began to speak like the lemur. While he and Momo were having this conversation, the others saw them. Aang? Katara spoke out, getting his attention. We're all starting to get a little worried about you. You've been awake too long, Sokka stated. And you're acting downright weird. Tof told him. You've got to take care of yourself. You can't go on like this, Appa declared. Nobody seemed to notice that the bison was standing on two legs and talking. Aang groaned. Look, I appreciate what you guys are saying. But the stress and the nightmares, they were just too much. Staying awake is the best way to deal with it. Yeah, leave the kid alone. Momo told them, surprising Aang. Hey, who asked you? Appa demanded. They began growling at each other. Aang tried to calm them down. Guys, come on. No. I am sick of this guy always mouthing off and telling me what to do, the sky bison growled. Oh, you don't like it? Momo asked him. Well, let's go right now. Would you two knock it off? Akela asked the two of them, finally speaking. What are you going to do? Slug it out like samurai? Sokka, what should we do? Ng asked Sokka, grabbing his shirt. About what? Sokka asked, like he couldn't see what was happening. About that. He pointed at Momo and Appa. Both were dressed up in samurai clothing. Momo wore the fur at the top of his head in a topknot, and wore a blue yukata. Appa wore samurai armor that was colored red with an arrow on the helmet. While the lemur was only wielding one katana, the sky bison was using three. Akela groaned. I just had to open my mouth, he groaned. I'm not doing commentary this time. He yelled at the two before turning his head to Sokka. Wake me when they're done. Sure thing, Akela, the tribesman replied. The wolf padded away. Meanwhile, Momo and Appa charged at each other, screaming battle cries. Their swords clashed together and they stayed there, trying to push the other back. Meanwhile, the koala sheep had broken into parties, one for the lemur and one for the bison. Appa? 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 cheered one group. Momo! 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 cheered the other group. The two fighters disengaged and stepped back. Appa split his third into two and then resting on his tail. 
He spun into a twister and went at Momo. The lemur was able to block all the sword strikes, which was impressive. Come on, guys, Aang tried to talk to them. We're all on the same side. At that moment, a six-armed and floating on a cloud Guru Puthik showed, waving two cups of onion and banana juice and playing a vena. Chakras, chakras, everyone loves chakras, he sang. Chakras, chakras, chakra sandwich tastes good. Yum! As Appa and Momo fought, the koala sheep cheered. As they did that, rocks formed like snakes began to slide through the grass, around Aang and then away. The Ozai tree started dancing and Aang was surrounded by a ring of rocks and koala sheep while Appa and Momo still fought. That was when he realized the insanity of it all. I just need to jump in a cold waterfall. He declared before running screaming like a loon. That was a good party. Kankuro declared as he, his siblings, and Naruto made it back to the room the sand siblings had been given. Yes, it was, Tamari agreed. The food was great. She had eaten a great deal of tasty stuff at that party. I'll be sure to let the head cook know you thought so, Naruto told them with a smile on his face. We can let him know ourselves tomorrow, she replied as she flopped onto one of the beds. Plus, I can't wait to see how Azula does with those new knives of her, Kankuro said with excitement. When he heard those words, Naruto flinched. What is the matter, Naruto? Gara asked him, noticing the flinch. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. I need you guys to do something for me, he told them, opening his eyes again. What is it? He pulled out one of the sealed tags team Sasuma, Karinai, and Guy had brought with them. I need you to go home. They were shocked to hear him say that. What? Why? Temari asked. This isn't your war, he answered with complete seriousness. I thought the war was over, Kankuro said, still not believing that he had heard what he had thought he heard from the blonde. The paragon of the Fire Nation shook his head. Just because the Fire Nation took Ba Sing Se, doesn't mean the war is over. Tomorrow, the Avatar will be visiting us with a few of his friends. How do you know this? Gara asked him. That's classified information. He wasn't going to say anything else about it. But we can still help you fight them, the Kazakage said in protest. Gara, if Ba Sing Se hadn't fallen, you would have been fighting alongside the Avatar tomorrow as well as the Kanoha Shinobi, the blonde pointed out. He had been glad to prevent that, as he really didn't want to fight them. We're your friends, Naruto. Why are you refusing our help? Temari demanded. It's because you're my friends that I'm refusing. This isn't your war, guys. This isn't your responsibility. You should go home while you can. He gave them a small smile. Vacations have to end, right? We're not going to leave you to fight this alone, Naruto, Kankuro declared to him. We will help you. No, you won't. And if you won't leave willingly, I'll make you leave, he said in reply, quietly threatening them. Very well, Naruto, Gara said, surprising his brother and sister. We will go home. It's time I went back to my duties as Kazakage. The blonde was right. Vacations had to end. Thank you, Gara. He handed the redhead the tag. The sand siblings stood around the tag as it was placed on the ground. Will you come to visit? Gara asked him. Probably not, he answered with a shake of his head. The more he thought about it, the more he knew that it was a bad idea to go back to the elemental countries, even if for a visit. Then we will come visit you again. No, don't do that. Just stay there, please, he practically begged his friend. This side of the world has enough trouble with the Avatar and the royal flaming asshole. We don't need Shinobi thrown into the mix. Very well, as his siblings gathered around him and he focused on the seal, he heard Naruto walked out of the room. Goodbye, brother, the Kazakage said in a whisper. Naruto walked down the corridor. He didn't look back, but he heard the sound of a poof. He kept on walking, but he had heard the whisper. As he walked back to the camp, Aang saw what looked to be a bed of clouds in front of him, cradled by mist. He walked up to it and started testing it, making sure it was real. Oh look, another hallucination, he said, not believing what he saw. An imaginary bed made out of clouds. Hey, it's real. We spent hours on it. Tof told him. Both Katara and Sokka stood next to her. We made for you. A good night's sleep will probably take the crazy away. We hope, Sokka said as he stood next to a group of shaved koala sheep. Look, you guys keep telling me I need to sleep, but I can't. Aang told them angrily. The invasion's tomorrow. Aang. Katara began, 
only to have him cut her off. No, Katara. There's still so much I haven't learned. I don't need sleep. What I need is practice. Quick, hit me. He started to wobble as he tried to take a fighting stance. I'm not going to hit you, she told him. You want me to do it? Toph offered, only to have Sokka nudge her in the back. The waterbender walked closer to him. Listen to me. You've been training for this since the day we met. I've seen your progress. You're smart, brave, and strong enough. You really think so? He asked. She nodded. We all do, Sokka told him with complete confidence. You can do this, you're ready. You're the man, twinkle toes. Toph agreed. Thanks, guys, he said with a smile. He gave a big yawn and rubbed his eye. Katara helped him lay down on the bed. You know what? I think I am ready. He declared as he fell asleep, the others watching him. The doors were knocked down and Aang flew towards the full Fire Lord sword in hand. Your days of tyranny are over, Fire Lord. He declared. Really? Asked the faux fire lord. You're going to take me out? You're not even wearing pants. He smiled smugly. No, fire lord Ozai. You're not wearing any pants. He looked down and saw no pants. Pulling a cover with the fire nation symbol on it out of thin air, he held in front of his nether regions. No. My royal parts are showing. He said, screaming. Aang looked around and saw no sign of Naruto. In the real world, he had a smile of victory on his face. Azula sat in front of her mirror. Dressed in a sleeping robe, she had let her hair out of her bun and was brushing it, one of the few pleasures she allowed herself. She heard the door open and knew it was Naruto. Where did you go? She asked, not turning to face him. I saw the Kazakage and his family off, he replied. Will they be coming back? No. A shame. I like them. She continued brushing her hair. The silence between them went on for a couple of minutes. Did you enjoy the party? He finally asked her, a curious tone in his voice. I did, she answered, putting the brush down. Then why does it sound like you're both mad and disappointed? He could tell that just from her voice. I don't know, she replied. Maybe it's because my bodyguard didn't give me a present. I was wondering what he was going to give me. She had been wondering that for the last couple of days. He laughed when he heard that. Don't worry. He got you a present. It was just something he wasn't going to show in front of her father. Now she was curious. What is it? He walked up behind her. Close your eyes. She did so. She heard something moving and then felt something cool against her chest. Now open them. What she saw took her breath away. Hanging around her neck was the same beautiful green crystal he wore. Happy birthday, Azula, he said. It's beautiful, she said in a whisper. She didn't know what else to say. It was simply beautiful. And so are you, he replied. Turning around, he started to walk away. Wait, she said, standing up from where she sat and turning to face him. What is it? He asked, turning back to her face. She stood in front of him. Her hands slowly reached for the belt at her waist. Untying it, she let go and grabbed the edges of the robe near her neck. She pulled the robe off, letting it slide down her arms and down to the ground leaving her wearing nothing but her present. To say Naruto was stunned would have been an understatement. What the? He tried to think but couldn't. Way to go, Gaki. The QB cheered from inside his cage. Before he could even reply to the fox, Azula walked right up to him and kissed him hungrily on the lips. This sent them crashing down onto the bed, with Azula on top of him. Oh, no way is a host of mine going to be on the bottom. The fox declared before sending a tiny amount of his chakra to Naruto. With a savage growl, he flipped Azula, making her land on the bed and pinning her hands there. They stared at each other as he hovered over her. Golden eyes investigated Blue's one and vice versa. He began to kiss her, hungrily devouring her lips. She returned with equal passion and the room filled the sounds of heavy kissing and small pants. He let go of her so that he could explore of her chest, letting his hands know everything inch of it. She quickly untied the cloth belt, letting the vest fall open and opening his shirt, freeing his chest. Her hands began to roam around it, her brain almost begging her to know what it felt like. She began to stroke her finger around one of his nipples, making him shiver and groan. Seeing her victorious smile, he got back at her by finding a particular spot on her back. He pressed down, making her arch her back and gasped, 
which he took advantage of by invading her mouth. As his hands trailed down to her hips, he suddenly stopped. What's wrong? she asked. We shouldn't do this, he replied, taking his hands off her hips he stood up and stepped away from her. She sat up. Why shouldn't we? It felt right to her. We just can't, Azula. I'm your bodyguard. That was all he could be. I don't care. She shouted, surprising him. I love you. He fell quiet. I know you do, but I just... He struggled to say the words, but they wouldn't come out. I'm sorry. He closed his shirt and vest and left the room. Azula watched him leave. No, I'm sorry, she whispered. She threw herself into her pillow. I shouldn't have done that. She repeated to herself as she cried into the pillow. That had been so stupid of her. What in the name of everything and anything holy is wrong with you? The fox bellowed at him as he walked down the corridor. That girl stripped naked in front of your eyes, all but jumped your bones and you walk away? That shouldn't have happened, Cuby, he replied, trying to focus on where he was going. The corridor was thankfully empty, so he could speak to the fox aloud. And yet it did. With your help, he accused the biju. I felt your chakra. He was horrified that he had allowed the fox's chakra to use him so. I was trying to help you. For the love of Kami, she said she loved you and you walk away? When did Naruto Uzumaki become a coward? The QB demanded. I'm not a coward. You walking out of that room says otherwise. I had to do that. No you didn't, you just ran away from her like you do with everything else. You pushed the sand siblings away and now you pushed her away. I pushed her away to keep her safe. He shouted. If he said the words aloud, they would have rushed down the corridor before him. What do you mean? The fox asked once the echoes had faded away. He wasn't sure about what the blonde was talking about. Think about it, Kyubi. What would people think if someone saw us sleeping together? Naruto asked. That kind of news would definitely reach Ozai's ears and if not him, it would reach out Jing. And she would take to him with embellishments. What do you think Ozai will do if he found that his daughter had slept with her bodyguard, one of the few men in the Fire Nation that doesn't obey his every command? No doubt he would try to have me killed and have her severely punished. Then Yao Jing would use the opportunity to have Azula killed. I refuse to admit my feelings for her so that doesn't happen. I can see what you're talking about, the Biju admitted. But didn't you ever think about what she thought? No, and that's probably what led to this. He took a deep breath to steady himself and lose his anger. Look, we have more things to worry about than my personal problems. We need to focus what needs to be done. I was. They passed the balcony, which gave them a look at the weather. Looks like there might be a storm coming in, the QB commented. In case you haven't noticed, QB, this side of the planet has been in a storm for the past century, Naruto said back, walking past the balcony. No, I think this is a different storm, the Biju thought to himself. Chapter 28 Warming up and moving forward Location, Fire Nation Morning had come and the group, minus Aang, had gathered together. They had all changed out of their disguises and back into their actual clothes. Katara decided to keep her hair out of her braid. Sokka studied the maps they had of the Fire Nation repeatedly. He rubbed one of his eyes, feeling slightly tired. Katara saw that and handed him a cup of water. That was when Aang joined them. Top of the morning, Momo, he said as the lemur landed on his shoulder. Sounds like you slept well, Katara noted, standing up. Like a baby moose lion, he declared. He did indeed look better. The bags under his eyes were gone, and he didn't look like he was about to snap at any minute. I'm ready to face the fire, Lord. So, what's your strategy for taking him down? Toph asked him. Gonna get your glow on and hit him with a little avatar state action? She punched the air a few times to emphasize her point. I can't, he told her. When I was shot by lightning, my seventh chakra was locked, cutting off my connection to all the cosmic energy in the universe. And no matter what he did, he couldn't unlock it. You know what I just heard. Blah, blah, spiritual mumbo-jumbo. Blah, blah, something about space, she said, using her hand as a mouth. She seriously did not understand what had just come out of the air nomad's mouth. Oh no, Katara said, seeing a huge bank of fog out on the ocean. Sokka, do you think the fog will delay the invasion? He stood up and looked closer at the fog. No, that is the invasion, he declared. Coming out of the fog were five ships. Five ships of water tribe make. 
They got down to the beach and Aang and Toph went to work. They bent the rocks beneath the water to rise up and formed five docks, one for each ship. The ships docked and their passengers began to disembark. Both Sokka and Katara ran towards Hakoda when they saw him come ashore. You made it, Dad. Katara cried with joy as she hugged him. Were you able to locate everyone I told you to find? Sokka asked. I did, Hakoda answered. But I'm a little worried, Sokka. Some of these men aren't exactly the warrior type. As if to prove his point, both Tho and Du got off the ship. They were wearing their normal clothes, consisting of a loincloth, wrappings around their arms and legs and a leaf hat, but had included their idea of armor, which was shin and arm guards and a wooden chest piece. Oh we, whistled Du. This place ain't nothing like the swamp. He pointed at a rock. What you reckon that is, though? Some sort of fire nation exploding trap what eat ya? It's just a rock, Du, though told him with both patience and exasperation in his voice. Well, I'll be. Is it just me, or are those fellas a little loose in the leaf hat? Hakoda asked aloud. I just wish they would wear pants, Bato told him as he passed by. Pants are an illusion, Hugh told as he too got off the ship, scratching his stomach. And so is death. The adults just looked at him in disbelief while Sokka smiled. They soon got every member of the swamp tribe off the ships when Katara heard a familiar voice. Hi, Katara. Turning around, she saw that it was Haru, who now sported a mustache and a goatee. Haru, it's so good to see you, she said, running over and giving him a quick hug. Tof, this is Haru, Aang introduced the two earthbenders. When we met him, his town was controlled by the Fire Nation. So he had to hide his earthbending. Katara inspired me and my father to take back our village, Haru explained, making Katara look away and blush. You helped us find our courage, Katara, Haru's father, Tyro, told her as he stood behind her and clasped her and his son on the shoulder. Now we're here to help you. Tov felt a familiar presence nearby. No way, she said, turning around and moving into an earthbending stance. Is that? She got her answer when two big arms picked her up. Hippo happy to see blind bandit declared the hippo, giving her a hug. The boulder stood behind him. You guys here for a rematch? She demanded. It wasn't the time, but she would oblige them. Negatory, the boulder told her. The boulder and the hippo no longer fight for others' entertainment. Now, we fight for our kingdom. Sweet, she said with a smile. That was much better. An explosion went off in one of the ships, getting the team's attention. As they went to go check what happened, the mechanist appeared above deck, coughing from all the smoke. His son, Tao, rolled down the ramp and onto the dock followed by his father as well as Pipsqueak and the Duke. Was that a new invention? Sokka asked as he, his father, and Aang ran up to them. Yes, the mechanist answered. But unfortunately, the incendiary capabilities of peanut sauce proved to be a failure. You're making peanut sauce bombs? He couldn't help but ask the question. They're destructive, Pipsqueak said. And delicious, the duke finished from atop Pipsqueak's shoulders. They licked the rest of the peanut sauce off while Momo tried to get the remnants, making them laugh. Were you able to complete work on the plans I sent you? Sokka asked the mechanist. Yes, I was, he answered excitedly. And I think the Fire Nation will be quite surprised. Aang, my dad and I made this for you, Tao said, handing the air nomad a staff. A new glider, Aang said as he watched handles and blue wings snap out. This is amazing. Now he could fly again. And as a special feature, I added a snack compartment, the mechanist told him, demonstrating how it worked. Oh, well, I'm sure that'll come in handy, he said hesitantly. That wasn't usually in an air nomad glider. But he wasn't going to say anything. I bet you're tired of being in this cell, old man, the guard said to Iroh as he trimmed his nails. Well, too bad. You're never stepping outside of these walls again. Breakfast, another guard announced, walking in with food. Careful, Ming, don't get too close, he said to the second guard as he stood up. His stench will knock you right out. He walked out of the cell laughing. She scowled at his back before turning back to face the cell. I snuck in some white jade tea, she told Iroh as she set the tray the food was on inside the cell. I know how you like rare teas. Thank you, Ming, he said, taking the tea. Ever since I was put in here, you've been very kind to me. It seemed like she had been the only one. The members of the invasion force sat in front of a stone stage that held a board. Sokka was sitting nearby, clutching his maps with a nervous grip. 
He was the one who had to explain the plan to everyone. But he was so nervous. Don't worry, his father told him. You'll do great. He took a deep breath and walked up onto the stage, getting everyone's attention. He tried to speak, but he just stood there, frozen on the spot and terrified. He had words. He had plenty of words. He even had a plan. But they wouldn't come out of his mouth. Nothing would. He felt a hand on his shoulder. Why don't you let me do this? Hakoda asked gently. He nodded numbly and walked back down. Hakoda put the maps on the board and then turned to face the crowd. Let me clarify a few points for everyone, the chieftain of the Southern Water Tribe began. Today is the day of Black Sun, and I want to thank you all for your self-sacrifice and your courage. There are two steps to the invasion, a naval stage and then a land stage. To gain sea access to the Fire Nation capital, we have to get past our first major obstacle here. He pointed at a spot on the map. The Great Gates of Azulin. He flipped to the next map. Next, we hit the land and we hit hard. We must fight past their battlements and secure the plaza tower. Once we do that, it's up to the royal palace. At that point, the eclipse will begin. Excuse me, the boulder raised his finger. The boulder is confused. Isn't the idea to invade during the eclipse, when the firebenders are powerless? The hippo nodded in agreement. The eclipse only lasts eight minutes, not enough time for the whole invasion, Hakoda explained. And the royal palace is heavily guarded by firebenders. So that's where we'll need the eclipse advantage the most. When this is over, the Avatar will have defeated the Fire Lord. We will have control of the Fire Nation capital and this war will be over. His words had everyone cheering, except for Sokka, who was still embarrassed for choking. After the meeting, everyone prepared for battle. Katara filled up her pouches to the brim with water. Tof and Hakoda, as well as many others, began to armor up. Standing on the cliffs overlooking the invasion force was both Appa and Akela. Appa was dressed from head to toe in steel armor with the arrow of the air nomads on his head. Akela was dressed in a leather cuirass that was steel-plated at his shoulders. Appa gave a roar as they stood there, waiting. Meanwhile, Aang knelt on some rocks, looking at the water's reflection. He had taken what was left of his clothes and wrapped them around his torso, leaving his right arm bare. He held his razor in his right hand and was using it to shave his hair off. The last patch was shaved off to reveal his arrow, the one he had been hiding all this time. He stood up, his arrow tattoos proudly showing themselves to the world once more. Zuko stood in front of his bed. He took out his headpiece, letting his hair fall. He removed his armor and placed it on the bed as well. Walking over to his desk, he dipped a brush in ink and began to write a letter. Over in her own room, Azula was changing too. She had completely changed out of the armor and clothes she wore and was standing in her undergarments. She put on a pair of black pants and then a sleeveless red shirt. She put on her boots but didn't tuck the pants legs in. She pulled a black leather vest over the shirt and buttoned it up. She grabbed the belt that Mai had bought for her and wrapped it around her waist, making sure it was tight. After checking that the daggers were secured, she put on the gloves that Tai Lee had given her. She looked herself over in the mirror. That was when she realized she was still wearing the necklace Naruto had given her. Should I give it back? She asked as her hands drifted towards it. She stopped and shook her head. No, I want something to remember him by. Sokka stood on a small cliff, overlooking the ships and the sea. He had already dressed himself in armor and was staring at the wolf helmet in his hands. He heard a glider moving through the air and saw Aang landing next to him. We've been looking all over for you, he said. The boats are ready to leave. I messed up Aang, the tribesmen told him. What? The invasion plan was my moment of truth, and I completely froze. He couldn't feel any more embarrassing. Sokka, that speech wasn't your moment of truth, the avatar told him, placing a hand on his shoulder. That was just public speaking, and no one's really good at that. My dad is. He protested. He explained the plan perfectly and inspired everyone, like a real leader should. That was something he wanted to be and yet, was still unable to reach. Look, your moment of truth isn't gonna be in front of some map. It's gonna be out there on the battlefield. Ing pointed out to the sea to emphasize his point. How do you know we're gonna win? Sokka asked him. I already failed the world once at Ba Sing Se. I won't let myself fail again. He opened up the glider. I'll see you down there. He flew off, back down to the docks. You won't allow yourself to fail, huh? 
the tribesman repeated, looking at the wolf helmet again. The kids got the right idea, a familiar voice said to him. He looked up. It's been a while, Sifu, he remarked, seeing the spirit hovering over the open space, just before the cliff's edge. Sifu stared into his eyes. You're scared, aren't you? You're scared of the oncoming fight. He nodded. Yeah, I am. Good, that means you have a brain in your head, the spirit declared with an approving tone. That caught the tribesmen off guard. I'm sorry? Saka, the ones who die first on the battlefield are the ones who think they're invincible. It's the ones who think nothing can stop them who usually end dying, wondering how it could have happened to them. You're scared. You have this feeling within yourself that's telling you that you might die, and you're scared of it. Accept the fear, accept the fact that you may possibly die and the only way to avoid it is to be faster than the other guy. He listened to what the mysterious spirit had said. I guess you're right. Thank you, Sifu. He bowed his head in thanks. Anytime, it's always a pleasure to help one of my paragons. Sifu stopped speaking and looked at the armor he was wearing. That armor would suit you, if you were just a warrior of the Southern Water Tribe. But you are not. He reached out and touched the symbol of the Water Tribe on his chest. The armor began to change. The color turned darker until it was midnight blue. The fur and wool changed to stiff leather that was reinforced with steel plating. The helmet turned blue-gray and grew heavier as the fabric changed into leather as well. But what stood out the most with all of this was that the symbol of the water tribe had changed into the symbol of the paragons. To be more specific, it changed into his symbol of the paragons, the same one etched on his medallion. Now that's armor befitting a paragon of the water tribes, Sifu told him with approval before he disappeared. Sokka stared at the space where the spirit had floated for a second. Then he walked back down to the docks, where everyone was waiting for him. Sokka, are you okay? Hakoda asked his son. Yeah, dad, he replied as Akela padded up beside him. Sorry, I had a moment of self-doubt. We all have those, his father said with assurance in his voice. He then looked at the armor his son wore. Where did you get that? My Sifu gave it to me. He said it was befitting of a paragon. The water paragon answered as he absently scratched Akela's ear. He was right. Everyone agreed with Hakoda's statement. The armor managed to make Sokka look both regal and deadly at the same time. Now, there's just one thing left to do. He looked his son straight in the eye and then, to the surprise of everyone there, he bowed. My lord Sokka, will you do the honors? He took a deep breath and nodded his agreement. He walked past his father, putting on his helmet and with Akela following him. After a few steps, he turned to face the assembled water tribe warriors. Who are you? He asked them all. His friends weren't exactly sure, but they could have sworn something in his voice had changed. We are the wolves of battle, our teacher is Akela, the alpha of all and none, he who walks the ice alone and fights with many at his side, the warriors said together as one. What was happening was one of the water tribe's pre-battle rituals, which supposedly comes one of the spirits who watched over them. The water tribes had many myths and stories to tell at the fire. The most popular ones were the ones about the pack of Akela, a group of white wolves that would only band together in times of strife and conflict. The most prominent of these wolves was Akela himself. The stories say that when Tue and La had come into the physical world, he had followed. He was a spirit of war, but there were many spirits of war. He was the spirit of learning of war. He taught how to fight and how to act so that when one was in a war, one might be able to live. His first students were the wolves who would eventually become his pack. Once he had taught them, he ordered them to walk their own paths. Soon after, he found the people of the water tribe. He took the men who were non-benders and taught them how to fight. Since then, every warrior who hails from the water tribes calls Akela their first teacher. That is why instead of praying to Tue and La for strength, they pray to Akela. If you are wolves, let me hear you howl, Saka ordered. They tried to do and the howling had echoed across the harbor but he didn't like it. That sounded like the mewling of pups. He yelled, making every non-water tribe member there take a step back in surprise at his anger. Are you sure you're students of Akela? Yes, we are. They answered fiercely. Their blood started to run hot. It was a matter of pride to be called a student of Akela. Even though they knew it was a part of the ritual, it still got them angry to be asked if they actually were. Then let me hear the howl of wolves of battle. He threw his head back and howled into the air. The warriors did as well. This howl was way much better than the first one. Even Akela joined the howl, 
and no one could tell him apart from the humans. They all just watched as the howling filled the air, sounding like a challenge to the Fire Nation. That has got to be the most exhilarating and most terrifying thing I've ever heard, Haru stated, having felt the hairs on the back of his neck rise up. Everyone else nodded in agreement. If skill and ferocity was all that was needed to win a fight, the warriors of the Water Tribes would undoubtedly rule the side of the planet, the mechanist told them as the howling stopped. After that, everyone boarded the ships and set sail. Bateau kept an eye out with his telescope. Soon, they saw what they were heading for. There they are, the great gates of Azulin, Hakoda declared. I don't see any gates, Katara commented. She only saw a statue of the late Fire Lord Azulin, two dragon statues at either end of the statue. Katara, you and the waterbenders from the swamp whip a fog cover. We'll sneak by them statues just we sneak by that Fire Nation blockade, declared though. They bend up a fog bank that hid all of the ships. They got closer and closer to the gates, inside the fog. Keep it up, Hakoda told them. We're almost through. Of course, that was when things got a little complicated. They heard a warning bell go off. The dragon statues held the ends of a net in their mouths. The net tightened up and as it reached its full height and length, it was set on fire. That's when everyone figured out it was a gate, just a gate done in true Fire Nation style, big and on fire. As they all looked at the gates, they heard jet skis coming at them. Looking at the water, there were indeed jet skis coming at them, carrying soldiers. Everyone below decks. Ordered Hakoda. They all hurried down the stairs. Let's hope your invention works, he told Sokka before they joined them. The soldiers on the jet skis surrounded the ships and boarded them. They quickly went below deck and burst into the quarters, only to find no one there. The same was on every ship. No one's on board, sir, a soldier told the leader. Where'd they go? She asked. The answer was simple and yet would have sounded ludicrous to them. The entire invasion force had boarded submarines and was now sailing under the great gates of Azulin. Appa was swimming behind them, being able to breathe due to an air bubble. You've really outdone yourself this time, son, Hakoda told Sokka. The two of them, along with Pipsqueak, Bateau, and the mechanist were standing in the front of the lead submarine. Yeah, congratulations, Sokka, Tof said in misery from where she sat on the floor. You've managed to invent a worse way of travel than flying. She tried not to throw up. Helmet? Offered the duke, handing his helmet out to her. She took it and hurled. Well, I just came up with the idea, Sokka told them all. The mechanist did all the work. Oh, don't sell yourself short, my boy, the mechanist replied from where he sat at the controls. It was your idea to use waterbending to make the subs sink and float. Brilliant. Though your drawings were a bit crude, the explanations helped immensely. Unfortunately, there is one problem I couldn't fix. The subs have a limited air supply. Before we land on the beaches, we'll need to resurface. Lunchtime, General Iroh, Ming announced as she walked into the room. And this time, I brought you an extra bowl of rice, she said that last part in a whisper as she put the tray down. Thank you, Ming, he told her. Your little gestures of kindness have made my days unbearable. I think you should take the rest of the day off. She was confused by what he said. What? You don't look well. Maybe you should go and rest. No, I feel fine. It was the truth. She wasn't sick at all. Trust me. It is better that you are not here this afternoon. She nodded, getting the hint, and walked out of the room. The subs had surfaced, and everyone was out on the tops. While everyone stretched, the duke cleaned out his helmet. So, this is it, huh? Ng asked Katara, Tof and Sokka once he landed on their submarine. Are you ready to let the Fire Nation know the Avatar is alive? Sokka asked him back. I'm ready, he answered firmly before pulling everyone into a group hug. I hope you kick some serious Fire Lord but twinkle toes, Tof told him. Everyone, listen up. Hakoda called out, getting everyone's attention. The next time we resurface, it'll be on the beaches. So stay alert and fight smart. Now break time's over, back in the sub, he ordered. Sokka and Tof broke the hug and walked back to the hatch, leaving Aang and Katara alone. Katara slash Aang, I, they said at the same time. You go first, he told her. We've been through many things together, and I've seen you grow up so much. You're not that little goofy kid in the iceberg anymore. Aang blushed at those words. I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm really proud of you. Everything's gonna be different after today, isn't? Yes, it is. 
What if, what if I don't come back? He had to ask. Aang, don't say that. Of course, you'll, she was interrupted when he kissed her. She was surprised and when he stepped back, she looked away and blushed. He opened the glider and took off. She watched him fly away. Katara, what are you doing? Sokka called out from the hatch. It's time to submerge. What? Right, I'm on it. She leapt onto Appa and bent a bubble of air over his head. Appa dived and the subs followed. Zuko walked into Mai's room. He looked at the picture of him and Mai. I'm sorry, Mai, he said, looking away. He left a note on her bed and left. Over in the royal palace, Azula was standing in front of Naruto's door. She pushed it open. Naruto? She called out. Nobody answered, the room was empty. Agni. I wanted to talk to him. She looked around. It seemed strange but without him in the room, it felt bare, empty. If he's not here, she said as she walked out of the room, closing the door. Aang flew over the land, trying to concentrate. His concentration broke when he heard growling coming from his stomach. He repeated the motions the mechanist did and ate the snacks that came out. What do you know? It did come in handy, he remarked as he flew on. A periscope popped out of the water. Hakoda looked through at the Fire Nation defenses. Everyone in position, he ordered to the soldiers in the sub once he saw the defenses. Earthbenders, into your tanks. This is going to be a rough ride. Everyone started moving as he spoke, going deeper into the sub. It was happening in everyone. They approached the gate, raising the alarm of the Fire Nation defense. They quickly fired harpoons at the shadows in the water, which were mostly dodged. One harpoon got lucky and pierced through a hull of one of the subs, causing water to flood through. A nearby waterbender managed to freeze the water, but the harpoon was still caught, as was the chain it was attached to. The sub was pulled out of the water. It would have been the end for that particular sub had Katara not flown Appa out of the water and sliced through the chain holding it. The sub fell back into the water and rejoined the others. Ready the torpedo, Hakoda ordered as he looked through the periscope at the grates in the defense. In the bottom of the sub, frozen Fire Nation torpedoes were being loaded into the tubes. Launch! He ordered. The waterbenders bent the torpedoes out of the tubes and sent them flying at the grates, destroying them. They passed through the grates and made their way to the beaches. Everyone waited in silence, but in their minds they were offering one last prayer to whatever spirit gave them comfort and strength. The subs came up out of the water and hit the beach, despite incoming from the Fire Nation. The front of the subs opened and revealed another of Sokka's and the Mechanist's inventions, tanks in the shape of caterpillars powered by earth bending. They took the lead and the soldiers on foot soon followed, screaming battle cries. They quickly got into formation, moving between the tanks for protection. Supply trucks, carrying rocks and water, followed them. One such truck dropped three rocks for the boulder, Hippo and Toph, who hurled them at a battlement tower up on the walls. As this went on, Katara and Appa arrived, ready for the fight. Gates at the sides opened and the Fire Nation's tanks arrived to confront the invasion force. The earth-bending tanks kept moving undeterred. One crushed a battlement tower while another smashed a Fire Nation tank. But despite that, the invasion force was soon surrounded on both sides by Fire Nation tanks. The waterbenders bent water from a nearby supply truck to defend against the bursts of fire thrown at them. Both Tho and Du stepped forward and bent their water at one of the tanks, knocking it sideways and sending it crashing into another one. We're a man down, Tho stated as he and Du threw another round of water at the tanks. Where in tarnation is Hugh? As if to answer his question, a familiar-looking creature made from seaweed appeared out of the water. It quickly demolished a couple of tanks, sending one flying up into a battlement tower. Hey Hugh! Called out Du. Where you been? The seaweed that held the monster together opened a hole, revealing Hugh. Commune in with nature, he answered. It takes a while to collect this much seaweed. He quickly covered the hole when a ball of fire came at him. A group of Komodo rhino carrying miniature catapults fired burning rocks at a group of water tribe warriors. The warriors kept moving, the rocks overshooting themselves. Another group of rhinos charged at them. Sokka didn't focus on what happened to the other warriors. He focused on who was in front of him. He leapt onto the horns of the rhino, sliced the spear the soldier was carrying almost in half and then plunged his jian into the soldier's heart, killing him. He pulled out the jian and pushed the dead soldier off. Dad, look out! He cried. Hakoda had lost his shield due to a fire burst. Another soldier tried to attack him, 
only to be disarmed and killed by a spear through the chest. Another soldier tried to hit him with a burst of fire, but he blocked him with one spear and stabbed his heart with the other. Two more soldiers came at him. He killed one by throwing one of his spears at him. The other was killed when Akela pulled him to the ground and tore out his throat. Hakoda joined Saka on the rhino while Akela ran alongside. Meanwhile, the invasion force was having difficulties. The battlement towers kept aiming for the supply trucks, hitting them in the rock or water. A few of the drivers, like the mechanist, got lucky and were blown clear by the blast. Others were caught in the explosion. Hugh's seaweed creature was also being targeted, making it lose an arm. One of the earth-bending tanks was knocked to its side by one of the battlement towers. Unless they got it upright again, the tank was useless. Saka, we've got to take out those battlements. Hakoda told him. It's our only chance. He looked at the battlements. I've got an idea, he said. He urged the rhino back to the invasion force. Katara, we need a ride. He called out to his sister. They quickly boarded Appa and he took off and flew at the battlement towers. Hanging from Appa's horn, Saka drew his jian and cut off the head of the missile launcher at the first tower. Hakoda was next. He armed two small bombs and threw them into the next battlement. The two soldiers who manned the tower tried to get out, but only one of them got lucky. The other one got caught in the explosion and died. Katara stood up on Appa's head. Attached to the sky bison's sides was a barrel each, filled with water. She broke open the barrels and coated her arms with the water. They approached the tower and she bent the water into it, freezing its occupants and leaving their heads free so they could breathe. Appa landed between two towers and Hakoda, Saka and Katara leapt off. You two take out that battlement, he told them, pointing at one of the towers before looking at the other one. I got this one. Watch each other's backs. He ran to his tower, and they ran towards theirs. Katara aimed to kill this time, Saka told her. What is wrong with you? She asked him not believing what she had just heard him say. You want me to kill people? We're in the middle of invading the Fire Nation capital. Of course we have to kill people. He sliced through the door and kicked it open. She took over by throwing water at the two soldiers manning the tower, freezing them solid except for their heads. Sokka didn't say anything. He just climbed the ladder and cut the missile launcher in half, causing the half hanging out of the tower to fall off and explode when it hit the rocks below. They ran out of the tower and saw Hakoda climb over the roof of his tower and leaping in. They heard fighting, but also saw an explosion go off. They were scared, but they saw their father stumble out of the tower with smoke billowing out behind him. He staggered forward a few steps, clutching his side, and then collapsed. Dad? called Katara, unsure if he would get up. Dad! shouted Saka as the two of them ran over to him. Zuko knelt in front of a picture of his mother. I know I've made some bad choices, he told her. But today, I'm gonna set things right. He stood up, grabbed a bag and his swords, and walked out of his room. Over in her room, Azula was kneeling in front of the statuette that the sand siblings had given her. I don't know what you thought of me, she told the statuette. But I'm doing what I think is right. I can only hope that you will forgive me for what I have done to our family. She stood up, took the statuette and the painting that Cory had given her, and hid them away. She walked out of the room and down the corridor. When she turned the corner, she almost ran into Zuko. Azula, he said, surprised to see her. Zuko, she replied, just as surprised, but keeping it hidden. You're doing the same thing? He couldn't help but ask her. Yes. He walked past her. Follow me. Appa flew down next to the subs and landed. Sokka and Katara laid Hakoda down on the ground and Katara started to heal him. How does that feel, Dad? She asked him. Ah, a little, better, he answered. He sat up. I need to get back to the troops. You're hurt badly. You can't fight anymore. Everyone's counting on me to lead this mission, Katara. I won't let them down. He tried to stand up, but the pain stopped him. Can't you heal him any faster? Sokka asked Katara. I'm doing everything I can. He fell silent. He looked back at the fighting and then looked at Akela who nodded in agreement. I'll do it, he declared. No offense, Sokka, but you're not exactly Mr. Healing Hands, his sister told him with the barest amount of sarcasm in her voice, she couldn't help it. No. He stood back up. I'll lead the invasion force. Don't be crazy, Sokka, his sister warned. Maybe I am a little crazy, 
but the eclipse is about to start, and we need to be up that volcano by the time it does. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. You can do this, Hakoda told him. I'm proud of you, son. There was a quiet pride in his voice, but his children heard it. I still think you're crazy, Katara said to her brother. But I'm proud of you too. He put his helmet back on and climbed aboard Appa. Akela joined him. Yip yip, he told Appa and the sky bison took off. They flew back to the battle, where Fire Nation tanks lay around, either smashed or frozen. Appa landed in front of a Fire Nation tank and knocked it away with his head. Sokka jumped onto his back and turned to face the invasion force. Listen up, everyone, he called out. I want the tanks in wedge formation, warriors and benders in the middle. We're taking that tower and heading for the royal palace. The tanks formed up and the foot soldiers got behind them. The remaining supply trucks were in the rear. When all was ready, Sokka drew his jian. Charge. Ng stood on the edge of the volcano before flying down. He flew down to behind a building, attempting to hide. He looked over the edge and saw nothing. No one was in the streets. There wasn't a single sign of life. That's strange, he noted. But he didn't ponder it. He ran to the royal palace, kicked in the door and leapt in with the glider staff at the ready. The avatar is back, he declared, to an empty hall. Hello? Anyone home? He called out. The tanks kept moving forward, regardless of what was thrown at them. Meanwhile, Sokka drove one of the supply trucks that were rigged with explosives at the wall. He leapt off at the last moment before it hit the wall, causing to explode. That left a giant hole in the wall, which the foot soldiers used to charge through and push the enemy back. The Fire Nation is falling back, Tyro declared. Bato heard Appa landed behind him. Sokka, we're on our way to victory. He announced with certainty in his voice. Sokka only looked up at the volcano. It wasn't over yet. Ng leapt through the curtain that led into the throne room. But no one was there either. The empty throne almost seemed to mock him. No, he said, dropping the staff and falling to his knees. No, no, no. Fire Lord Ozai, where are you? I think it's pretty obvious that he's not here, dipshit. A voice rang out in the chamber, getting his attention. He grabbed his staff and whirled around. Who's there? What? You can't remember my voice? You really are an idiot. Naruto walked out from behind a column, showing himself. You? Asked Aang, completely surprised by the blonde's appearance. Me, he answered. How you've been? When was the last time we saw each other? Was it at Wan Shirtong's library? Or was it in old Ba Sing Se? He asked, taking a thinking pose. Oh. I know. It was at that school that had the dance party. I'm assuming that was your work? You knew I was there? He had known he was there and did nothing to stop him? Yeah, I saw you there. You were the one having the panic attack, Naruto commented like it was nothing important. Why did you let me escape? Why didn't you tell anyone about me? And dash your hope that you might actually emerge victorious in this invasion? Why would I do that when I can just let you find out for yourself? He was becoming confused by the blonde was saying to him. What? What do you mean? Isn't it obvious? Look around. The fire paragon gestured widely around the chamber, emphasizing his point. There's no one here. Well, except for us. The avatar's eyes widened when the realization struck him. You knew we were coming. Correct. I guess you are gaining IQ points after all. Even though it had sounded like a compliment, he made it sound like it was an insult. I've been getting reports about where you and your team were. Always about a group of kids and what they did. So, I've been tracking you and knew you were coming this way. If you knew, why would you let us get this far? If he had known where they had been the entire time, he could have just passed the word on and had them stopped in their tracks. But he didn't. To teach you a lesson, there are no easy ways out. If Aang had been confused before, now he felt like he didn't understand. What are you talking about? You keep trying to take the easy way out every time you face a major situation. Look where it's gotten you. Wandering around the royal palace, demanding the Fire Lord show himself. What, did you think he was just going to stay in one place and wait for you to come to him? Um, kinda. He grinned foolishly when he answered. The blonde groaned at that answer. About that comment concerning your IQ points, I take it back. Aang's grin fell. Well, why don't you tell me where he is? When he didn't get an answer he tried to press on. 
Come on, Naruto, why won't you help us? It's obvious that you don't like things here in the Fire Nation. If you join us, you can help us, Cha. He was smashed into a pillar before he could finish. Naruto's hand was gripped around his throat and held it tightly. Watch your mouth, brat. The paragon of the Fire Nation snarled at him. Don't presume you know everything about me. He's gonna kill me, Aang thought in fright. It was the only thought that filled his mind and he honestly believed it would happen. But to his surprise, his neck was released and he fell to the ground. As he tried to regain his breath, he looked up at Naruto. I might not like a couple of things about the Fire Nation, but I can deal with them, he told the airbender. However, all of the things I hate are because of you. Don't ever think it would be simple for me to join you when you can't see what you did. I didn't do anything to the Fire Nation, he instantly protested. They're the ones who are doing horrible things. Don't be so naive, Naruto barked out, his voice filling the hall. It is because of you that places like the river town you visited became polluted, unfit for inhabitation. It is because of you that people like Hama have so much hatred. It is because of you that the schools here teach their students to think what they're doing is right and just. It is because of you that men like Chao can get more and more power. This entire war is your fault, yours and that bastard Roku. You're wrong, he shouted, leaping up to his feet. This isn't Roku's fault. It's Sozin's. And did Roku told you that? Did he show you his past? He nodded. Yes, he did. He showed me what happened and how Sozin started the war. He then noticed Naruto was trembling. Before he could ask what was wrong, the paragon began to laugh, loudly. His laughter echoed through the throne room and the entire palace. What's so funny? He demanded. The blonde stopped laughing, turned around, and walked away. A little tip for you, Avatar Aang. He said the last two words mockingly. Even your past lives can lie to you. What do you mean? Naruto didn't pay him any attention. He just walked through the entrance to the throne room. Wait. Come back. He raced after him, but once he burst through the curtain and back into the hallway, there was no sign of the paragon. Where did he go? He asked aloud. Arg, I don't have time to worry about that. He flew down the corridor. Naruto watched him go in silence, hanging from the ceiling. Like it would be that easy for me to join you, he thought to himself. It could be that easy, Kit, the QB told him. It's not, QB. I have a duty here in the Fire Nation. And what if that duty was not aligned with the Fire Nation anymore? He didn't reply. Chapter 29 Standoffs and Falling Back Location, Fire Nation As the moon slowly crawled in front of the sun, the battle raged on. Hugh and a few others stood guard over the subs while the others were trying to make their way up the volcano. For now, the movement had come to a standstill. Fire Nation catapults were hurling flaming rocks at the invasion force, trying to destroy the invasion tanks while a few of their own tanks gave support. The invasion tanks had been put end-to-end, -end, creating a protective wall. The sides opened and earthbenders would bend rocks at the enemy. If they didn't have a rock handy, they could still move the earth to unsettle any enemy heavy equipment. They used that tactic on a few of the enemy's tanks. Behind the wall of tanks, Sokka coordinated with Bato and the leader of the Earth Kingdom soldiers. A rock from one of the enemy catapults smashed down nearby. He raised his hand halfway to his head to protect it if any big rocks came down. When he opened his eyes, he saw something that was both a surprise and a relief. Dad, he said with a smile. Hakoda was coming through the gate, supported by Katara. You're on your feet again. He came over to them with Tof joining them. Thanks to your sister, Hakoda told him as he sat down on a nearby rock. I'm in no shape to fight, but maybe there's some way I can help. Everything's going smoothly, he told his father, kneeling in front of him. And the eclipse hasn't even kicked in yet. Let's hope our luck holds out. He noticed Katara had stepped away. Katara, you seem distracted. Is something wrong? He asked his daughter. She looked up at the sky, tracking a flying object. Yeah, is that, is that Aang? What? Sokka asked, looking up. Sure enough, Aang was flying towards them, dodging rocks and fireballs before landing in front of them. Please tell me you're here because the Fire Lord turned out to be a big wimp and you didn't even need the eclipse to take him down, he practically begged. He wasn't home, Aang said in reply. No one was. The entire palace city is abandoned. The only person I met there was Naruto. A look of both shock and surprise passed over the water paragon's face. He knew. 
They knew. Mentally, he began to chastise himself. Of course, Naruto would know. He had been to Wanshirtong's library long before they had. It's over. The Fire Lord is probably long gone, far away on some remote island where he'll be safe during the eclipse, the Avatar said in a defeated voice. No, my instincts tell me he wouldn't go too far, the tribesman objected quietly, thinking it over. He would have a secret bunker, somewhere he could go and be safe during the siege but still be close enough to lead his nation. If it's an underground secret bunker we're looking for, I'm just the girl for the job, Tove declared, pointing at herself. The mechanist gave me this timing device. He pulled out said device and looked at it. It looks like we've got about ten minutes until the eclipse. Ten minutes to find the Fire Lord. We can still do this, Aang said with conviction in his voice. We can still win the day. Wait, Katara said. If they knew we were coming, it could all be a trap. Maybe we should use the time we have left to make sure we all get out of here safely, she told Sokka. That might be the best choice, he agreed. Especially if Naruto knew we were coming. If the blonde was waiting for them, things would become much, much more difficult. Everyone who's here today came prepared to risk everything for this mission, Hakoda told them. They know what's at stake. If there's still a chance and there's still hope, I think they would want Aang to go for it. What do you think? Sokka asked Aang. You're the one who has to face the Fire Lord. Whatever you decide, I'm with you. The Avatar stood up and faced the volcano. I need to try, he declared. I guess that settles it. He stood up. Tof and I will go with him in Appa. Katara, you stay here with Dad. Akela, stay with them and protect them. The wolf nodded in agreement. Aang, Sokka and Tof quickly boarded Appa and took off, flying to the volcano. But instead of landing in the city... They landed on the side of the volcano. Do you feel anything down there? Ng asked Toph as she felt the earth. Yep, she answered, kneeling on the ground and feeling the earth with her hand. There are natural tunnels crisscrossing through the inside of the volcano. Anything else? Asked Sokka. Is there a structure somewhere? She slammed her hands into the earth, getting an extra feel. There's something big, dense and made of metal deep in the heart of the volcano. Sounds like a secret bunker to me he stated. She didn't reply, she simply bent open a hole that led into one of the tunnels. Stay safe. We'll be back soon, Aang told Appa and Momo before the humans went into the hole. She checked the earth again once they were in the tunnel. This way, that one's a dead end. She told them, running down the tunnel. What would we do without you? Sokka asked her as they ran. Perish in burning hot magma, she answered in complete deadpan. Yeah, pretty much, he agreed after looking a small amount of magma flow slowly down a current. They kept moving until they enter a chamber that magma erupting from several spots on the ground. The tunnel continues on the other side. And it leads right to the bunker, she told them. We'll have to be fast, but careful. The tribesman started to move forward but was caught off guard when magma erupted right in front of him. And quickly cooled the magma with a blast of air. How is that careful? He asked Sokka. I was wrong. We need to be fast, careful, and lucky. They charged through the chamber, dodging magma that shot up from the ground. They made it through, but what was in the next chamber stopped them. There's no floor, Sokka stated as he looked at what was in front of them. It's just a river of lava. Ng simply opened his gilder. Climb aboard and hold on tight, he ordered the other two. While he flew across the river of lava, dodging the bubbles that would pop and spray lava. The others were holding on for dear life and screaming for dear life too. But in the end, they managed to make it to the other side and just kept on running. They soon came across something that got their attention. That's some door, Sokka declared. Said door was big and attached to what looked to be a metal sphere half buried in the rock. Tolf walked up to the door and knocked on it, testing out the metal. Not a problem, she stated before backing up. She lunged forward and bent the metal first using her elbows to dent it, and then using her fingers to bend the dent open, creating a hole in the door. She stepped and pointed forward before charging off. I am so glad we added you to the group, Sokka told her as he and Aang followed. The battle was pushed forward. The invasion force was slowly, but surely making their way up the mountain path that led into the volcano. The Fire Nation forces tried to stop them, but they weren't having much luck. The battlement towers tried to hit the foot soldiers but they were carrying shields over their heads and letting them overlap. 
The boulder and the hippo took care of the battlement towers by slamming their hands on the side of the mountain and bending the earth underneath the tower to collapse, making it fall. Other earthbenders repeated the idea. The captain who was in command of the defense looked back at the sun. Retreat. Everyone, move to the secondary positions. Retreat. He ordered. The soldiers did as they were ordered, running back up the mountain. The eclipse is only minutes away, Bateau addressed the invasion force. We should be able to make up the hill by the time it starts, and secure the entire palace when it's finished. The soldiers cheered at that declaration. We can wait here, if you want, Katara offered Hakoda. No, he replied. I want to press forward with the others. She helped him walk. Akela kept close to their side. War Minister Chin walked through the tunnels, whistling. When he saw the Avatar and his friends come out of the other tunnel, he let out a gasp of surprise. They heard the gasp, turned around and readied themselves for a fight. He raised his hands in surrender. The Fire Lord's chamber is that way, down the hall, to the left and up the stairs. You can't miss it, he told them. They crowded around and gave him a glare. Thanks, Ink told him with a small smile. They took off, leaving War Minister Chin alone. He put his hands down, took a quick look around and walked away, taking part in a time-honored tradition. He pretended not to see a damn thing. As they ran down the tunnel, Sokka checked the eclipse timer again. Only thirty seconds until the total eclipse, he warned everyone. They soon came to the door that led to the Fire Lord. Ink took a deep breath. I'm ready, he declared. I'm ready to face the Fire Lord. He blasted the doors open with his airbending. They came into the chamber, but it wasn't Ozai on the throne. The person waiting for them looked unfamiliar to the group entering the chamber but her slight facial expression gave off a frightening aura. So you are still alive, Yao Jing mused from where she lounged in the chair. I guess my aim was a little off. Wait, you were the one who shot me in Ba Sing Se? Ng asked, stunned. He had thought Zuko or Azula had been the one to do it. Well, I had meant to kill you, she commented offhandedly. Who the hell are you? Sokka demanded. What? You mean to tell me that my little brother and sister didn't tell you about me? I'm hurt. You're their older sister. No, wait, he said, cutting her off before she could speak. You look different from them. You're not their actual sister, are you? Oh, it seems the little peasant from the chunk of ice they call the South Pole seems to think he's clever, she mocked. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Yao Jing, eldest child to Fire Lord Ozai and half-sister to Zuko and Azula. So that would make you the illegitimate one then. You have quite the mouth, don't you? But it doesn't matter now. I've known about the invasion for months. He laughed at that. No, you didn't. Naruto knew and somehow, I don't think he would have told you. All three of them saw the flash of rage in her eyes when she heard that. Zuko and Azula stood outside a door in the tunnels. I'm ready to face you, Zuko thought to himself. Let's get on with it, he said aloud. Yeah, Azula agreed. He slid the door open and they walked into the Fire Lord's safety room. Ozai sat behind a line of Imperial firebenders carrying pikes. He was about to take a sip of tea when his children walked into the room. Zuko, Azula, what are you doing here? He asked them. As they climbed up the volcano, the mechanist took notice of the sun. The eclipse is starting, he announced. Put on your eclipse glasses. Everyone did as they were ordered. They continued climbing upward while Katara and Hakoda looked at the eclipse. The moon covered the sun, truly making it black. Why are you two here? Ozai repeated himself. We're here to tell the truth, Zuko told him. Telling the truth during the middle of an eclipse. This should be interesting. He waved the guards away. They turned and quickly left through side exits, closing the doors behind them. First of all, in Ba Sing Se, it was Yao Jing who took down the Avatar, not me or Azula, his son told him. Why would she lie to me about that? He knew for a fact that his bastard daughter wouldn't lie about that. Because the Avatar is not dead, Azula told him. He survived. What? Asked Ozai, shocked to hear that little piece of information. He's probably leading this invasion. He could be on his way here right now, Zuko agreed. Get out! Their father roared, standing up and pointing at the door. Both of you get out of my sight if you know what's good for you. That's another thing. I'm not taking orders from you anymore, the scarred dragon said in defiance. Neither am I, Azula agreed. You will obey me, or this defiant breath will be your last. The fire lord began to walk down the steps, 
only to stop when Zuko drew his swords and Azula her daggers. Think again. I am going to speak my mind and you are going to listen, Zuko ordered. Ozai knew that he would be defeated if he tried to attack his children now. So he sat back down. Where is he? Aang demanded. Where is the Fire Lord? You mean I'm not good enough for you? Yao Jing asked as she stood up from the chair. You're hurting my feelings. Stop wasting our time and give us the information, Sokka ordered, pointing his yen at her. You're powerless right now, so you're in no position to refuse. And stick to the truth, Tof told her. I'll be able to tell if you're lying. Are you sure? I'm a pretty good liar, Yao Jing said, walking forward a few steps. I am four hundred foot tall purple platypus bear with pink horns and silver wings. Okay, you're good, I admit it. She bent the floor to rise up and trap her. But you really ought to consider telling the truth anyway. Without any warning, the hold she was in started to crack and collapse, surprising the other three. When I left Ba Sing Se, I stole a few toys from my sister and convinced them to my way of thinking, the bastard daughter of the Fire Lord told them with nonchalance, wiping the rock dust off her armor. From above, two men in very familiar clothes landed. I believe you know the Daily agents. How in the name of the spirits did you do that? Saka asked in disbelief. The Daily are among the toughest people out there. I'm very persuasive, she answered with a smirk. But somehow, the tribesmen didn't believe it. After being initially surprised, Aang bent a gust of wind at them. The Daily stopped it by bending an earth wall together. They had made up the mountain and now stood on the edges. Surround the periphery, the toe ordered. We have to secure the palace by the time the eclipse is over. Otherwise, we'll be in for the fight of our lives. The tanks and the foot soldiers came down into the city quickly. However, there were still Fire Nation soldiers trying to defend their home. Stop, ordered Tyro. Surrender peacefully and we won't harm you. We'll never surrender, one of the soldiers declared. He tried to bend fire at them, but only got a puff of smoke. Okay, we surrender. There it is, the Fire Nation Royal Palace, Hakoda said as he and Katara walked to the edge of the volcano. We've come so far. It's not over yet, Katara told him as they walked down the rim. Aang and the others still had to get to the Fire Lord. For so long, all I wanted was for you to love me, to accept me, Zuko told Ozai. I thought it was my honor I wanted. But really, I was just trying to please you. You, my father who banished me just for speaking out of turn. My father, who challenged me, a thirteen-year-old boy, to an Agni Kai. How could you possibly justify a duel with a child? He demanded, pointing one of his swords at the Fire Lord. It was to teach you respect, Ozai told him. It was cruel, he challenged. And it was wrong. Then you've learned nothing. No, I've learned everything. And I had to learn it on my own. Growing up, we were taught that the Fire Nation was the greatest civilization in history. And somehow, the war was our way of sharing our greatness with this side of the planet. What an amazing lie, Azula remarked. Truly, she had believed all through her childhood. It wasn't until Naruto came and opened her eyes. Her brother nodded, having had the same eye-opening experience, albeit from exile. The people from this side of the planet are terrified by the Fire Nation. They don't see our greatness. They hate us and we deserve it. We've created an era of fear for this side of the planet, she told Ozai. And if we don't want it destroyed, we need to replace it with an era of peace and kindness. The Fire Lord laughed at those words. Your uncle has gotten to you both, hasn't he? Yes, he has, Zuko told him with a proud smile. Not only him, but Naruto too, Azula said. What they said only made Ozai angrier. Aang rushed forward, destroying the wall the agents made. They responded by bending the stone to rise into another wall. He jumped up and leapt off a steel column, landing on the other side. The agents bent up a chunk of rock each and threw at him, which he destroyed with two heavy kicks. As this happened, Tof burst through the wall and landed, sending the agents into the wall via two rock columns. They reacted by landing on the walls and sending their own columns at her. She blocked them by bending two slabs up to protect her. She then sent a rock line at Yajing who leapt off in a backflip, using the rock line as her jumping point. She landed in front of the throne and Aang went after her. One of the Daili agents noticed and followed. He leapt off the wall and bent another wall to come up from the floor. Aang leapt into the air and kicked through, making a hole. As he sent the agent flying into the ceiling, 
and taking him out of the fight, he bent a blast of air at Yao Jing, who dodged it and let it destroy the throne. She ran off to the side, where he sent another air blast at her. She dodged it by running up one of the columns and backflipped off it. She then ran past the second wall and towards the first. Aang chased after her, with Toph joining in the chase. The remaining Dai Li agent realized what she was going to do and helped her by bending a column underneath her feet, giving her the extra momentum to jump through the hole in the wall. What she didn't expect to see was Sokka waiting for her when she landed. He lunged forward, trying to catch her as she landed. But even though she was caught off guard, she reacted with ease. She twisted herself away from the lunge and landed in a crouch. Sokka realized what she was about to do and tried to back away, but she knocked his legs from underneath him, sending him to the ground. She took off, running to the door. The agent had followed her through the hole as did Toph and Aang. I can't pin her down, Aang told Toph as they ran after them. She's too quick. Toph faded off to the side when she heard that. Yao Jing ran through the door and the agent followed, bending the earth to block the door. Aang broke through with ease and continued chasing the two. The agent was knocked to the side by Column jutting out of the wall and Toph coming out of a hole in the wall. He was sent flying into a crevice of a metal beam. He tried to get out, but Toph blocked him and ensured he'd stay there by bending the metal tightly against him. Now that only leaves her, Sokka thought. You need to stop and think. A voice in his head commanded him, almost making him stop in his tracks. Think about what she's trying to make you do. Although he didn't know who or what the voice was, he realized what he was talking about. Wait, Aang, Toph. He cried out, making everyone stop. Stop attacking. Don't you see what she's doing? She's just playing with us. She's not even trying to win this fight. Oh, that's untrue, Yao Jing said. I'm doing the best that I can. You're trying to keep us here and waste our all time, Toph declared, pointing her finger at her. I believe your friend just said that, genius. And since you're blind, I'll tell you that I'm rolling my eyes, she said with a smirk. I'll roll your whole head. Sokka stopped the blind earthbender from attacking. She's just baiting you again. Okay, so what do we do? Just ignore her? Aang asked him. We don't have a choice. We just have to get out of here and find the Fire Lord on our own somehow. The three of them turned around and started walking away. It's a trap. Don't say I didn't warn you, Yao Jing said. Ignore. Sokka ordered his friends. So, Sokka's your name, right? She asked him. My favorite prisoner used to mention you all the time. This made him stop and look back. She was convinced you were going to rescue her. Of course, you never came, and she gave up on you. You can't believe how much fun it was torturing her. Beating her, giving her burn wounds, making her go days without food, it all gave me such a rush, she said that last part with a half-crazed grin. Too bad my father didn't allow me to resort to such more persuasive measures. When he heard all this, Sokka began to shed tears. The voice in his mind spoke again, this time with fury in its voice. She dares to think she can do all of that to our mate and thinks she can get away with it. Put her on her knees. Make her beg for mercy. It roared. He roared as well, charging at her. Come and get it, she said to herself, flicking a knife into her hand. However, she forgot that Toph could sense such things. She bent a rock up from the ground and pinned her to the wall with it attaching itself to her wrist. Before she could even try to struggle, Sokka was already on her. Where? Is. Suki? He growled. Though she looked expressionless on the outside, inside she was scared. Behind Sokka, she saw an image of a black wolf looking at her with the promise of a painful and a gory death. After we leave here today, Zuko told Ozai. I'm going to free Uncle Iroh from his prison and I'm gonna beg for his forgiveness. He's the one who has been a real father to me. He had been the one to keep an eye on him during his exile. Oh, that's just beautiful, Ozai replied with a chuckle. And maybe he can pass down to you the ways of tea and failure. We've also come to a more important decision, Azula said. We're gonna join with the Avatar and we're going to help him defeat you. Really? Asked the Fire Lord. Since you're both full-blown traitors now and you want me gone, why wait? I'm powerless. You've got your swords and your daggers. Why don't you just do it now? We know our own destiny. Taking you down is the Avatar's destiny. Zuko said as he sheathed his swords and Azula sheathed her daggers. Goodbye. They turned around and walked away. Cowards! Spat Ozai. 
You think you both are brave enough to face me, but you'll only do it during the eclipse. He stood up. If the two of you have any real courage, you'll stick around until the sun comes out. Don't you want to know what happened to your mother? That question made the two of them stop and turn back around to face him, making him smile. What happened that night? Azula asked him. This was information that they couldn't pass up. One night, their mother had disappeared and the next day, the previous Fire Lord had died. My father, Fire Lord Ezulin, commanded me to do the unthinkable to you, my own son, he said, looking at Zuko. And I was going to do it. Your mother found out and swore she would protect you at any cost. She knew I wanted the throne, and she proposed a plan, a plan in which I would become Fire Lord and your life would be spared. Where's Suki? Sokka demanded of Yao Jing. She didn't say a word. Answer me. Sokka, she won't talk, Aang told his friend. Where are you keeping her? He yelled at her. The black wolf behind him bared its fangs and began to snarl. She smiled smugly and kept her mouth shut. But it was all she could do not openly panic and beg them not to let the wolf get her. In her mind, she kept thinking about Chun's photo, holding on to it like a lifeline. Your mother did vicious, treasonous things that night, Ozai told his children. She knew the consequences and accepted them. For her treason, she was banished. So, she's alive? Zuko asked with relief in his voice, tears of happiness falling down his face. Thank you, Agni. Azula silently and gratefully thanked the spirit. If she's still alive, then we can find her. Perhaps, Ozai admitted. Now I realize that banishment is far too merciful a penalty for treason. He closed his eyes. The penalty for the both of you will be far steeper. As he felt the eclipse ending, he generated lightning and threw it at Zuko. He caught it, and was pushed back by the force of it. How dare him! A voice in his head, one didn't sound like the blue spirit or his younger self, said in outrage. He would dare to throw the wrath of the heavens at his own child. Return it to him in full force. Believe me, he answered silently, not even wondering who the voice was, I was planning on it. He redirected the lightning back at Ozai, sending him flying back into the Fire Nation banner behind him, setting it ablaze. You would dare do this to your own father. He shouted at the scarred dragon, standing up from where he fell. The fire grew up around him, like a protective barrier. Father? asked Azula in growing outrage. What father? What father would raise his children to believe that power is the only thing that matters in the world? What father would willingly attempt to murder his own son and banish his wife just so he could obtain the throne? What father would burn a woman, leaving her scarred beyond any help of healing, just because she wanted to see her daughter for one day? What kind of father is that? I had always thought you were the stronger of my children, Azula, he said to her. Will you prove me right and do your duty, as the daughter of the Fire Lord? Her response was to reach up and undo the headpiece, letting her hair fall down. She grabbed most of it in a tight grip and with the other hand, drew a dagger and sawed it off. She took the cut hair and threw into the fire. Her hair was now in the rough shape of a bob cut. You are not my father anymore, she declared. As Ozai just looked at the burning hair in stunned shock, both she and Zuko ran out of the room. Oh, it sounds like the firebending is back on, Yao Jing remarked. She forced Sokka back with a sweep of her leg bending an arc of fire. She sent another fireball at him. Tof pushed him out of the way, saving both. She black flipped onto the cuffs and broke free of them using her fire bending. She flipped forward and made Aang jump away with a flaming kick. Dad's all the way at the end of the hall then down a secret stairway on the left. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to see you now. She ran away. Silently, she was glad to be away from that black wolf. I fell for it. Sokka realized, completely too late. I used up all our time. It's not your fault, Sokka, Tov told him. She was ready for us. She had every move planned out. And now it's too late. Maybe it's not too late, Ain said. The eclipse is over. But I can face the Fire Lord anyway. No. That's not a good idea, the tribesman told him. But I'm ready. He protested. I came here with a job to do and everyone's counting on me. Naruto knew we were coming and so did the Fire Lord, Tove said. We thought we had surprise on our side, but we didn't. It just wasn't our day. What we need to do now is go help our friends. I guess you guys are right, he admitted, seeing the reasoning. You'll have another chance, Sokka told him. I know you will. 
They quickly made their way through the tunnels, trying to get out the way they came. I am sorry about what I did back there, the voice told him. I gave her enough time to delay. Who are you? Sokka asked silently. You still can't hear my name? The voice seemed to sigh. It's not important now, you need to focus. All was silent as they waited for something. Katara helped her father lean against one of the tanks, taking off the eclipse glasses. What should we do, Hakoda? Bato asked. Shouldn't something have happened by now? I don't know, Hakoda answered. But now that the eclipse is over, I expect we're going to see some firebenders any minute. Bato took a quick look up and was surprised at what he saw. Katara saw his surprise and turned in the direction he was looking. Behind the royal palace, several hot air balloons were rising in the air. My own invention! cried the mechanist in horror. Oh, this is terrible! But the worst had yet to come. Behind the war balloons, five airships with bronze dragon heads at the helm rose up behind them. They were much, much bigger than the two-man crew of the war balloons. Katara then heard a familiar sound. They're back! She cried, pointing at the incoming Appa. His passengers, the one who could see anyway, looked at what was in the air with dismay. The sky bison landed in front of Katara. It was all a trap, Sokka told his sister as he and Tof got off of Appa. Naruto had planned every move. We've just got to get the beach as fast as we can. If we can make it to the submarines, maybe we can get away safely. They've got our power, but so do I, Ng said opening up his glider. I'm gonna do what I can to slow them down. He took off into the air. Appa, you and I can help too, Katara told the sky bison, jumping on. They took off after him and they both flew up at the war balloons. Everyone, let's get to the subs. Sokka ordered, making everyone start running back the way they came. Aang approached one of the war balloons. After dodging most of the fireballs sent at him, he closed the glider and went through the balloon itself, tearing a hole in it and making it lose altitude. Katara approached another one on Appa. She bent her water to slice the balloon in half, making that one fall as well. They tried to get close to the airships, but the firebenders stationed out on the outside platforms of said airships sent a continuous barrage of fire at them, forcing them back. We can't keep them all back. Katara shouted at Aang as she bent her water into a shield, fending off the fireballs. There are too many of them. Let's join the others. Aang shouted back. They flew towards the invasion force, which was still trying to make it back to the subs. Zuko and Azula ran into the prison, which looked like it was the site of a battle. They went past several guards who cowered in fear as they ran by them. Uncle! cried Zuko as he stopped in front of Iroh's cell. It was empty, save for the unconscious guard. The cell looked like something had bursted open. Where's our uncle? He demanded of the guard, grabbing hold of his shirt. He's gone, the guard answered as a look of fear came onto his face. He busted himself out. I've he never seen anything like it. He was like a, one-man army. Zuko let go of the guard and he and Azula ran out of the cell. We need to get out of here, Azula told him as they raced through the corridors. Ozai is not going to take our defection lightly. Especially if Yao Jing is there to spur him on, Zuko agreed. I've got a war balloon nearby. We can use it to go follow the Avatar when he runs. How do you know he's going to run? She asked him. He always does. Anyway, I don't know when soldiers are going to arrive, but we need to. His words stopped as he and Azula stepped out of the prison. Leave right away, he finished weakly. Standing in front of the prison were soldiers. If he had to guess, there were enough to form two platoons. That was a lot of men. Seems like Ozai wants to make sure we stay, she remarked with a dry sarcasm. Detain the traitors. The captain ordered them all. They all took a stance and stepped forward. Jet propulsion? Suggested Zuko quietly. If you're up to it, she answered. We jump at the gate. Call it. Three, two, one, go. They charge at the soldiers, who were ready to fight. What they got instead was Zuko and Azula leaping over them, using their fire bending to push them further. They landed on the other side of the soldiers. They kept running and they could hear them coming after them. It wasn't until they heard two swords clanging against each other did they stop and turn. Lord Naruto, what are you doing? The captain cried at the blonde, shocked into stillness. Naruto had his jian out and had blocked one of the soldiers with a sword drawn. That in turn, made everyone stop and look at him. 
My job, he answered before disengaging and jumping back, landing next to Zuko and Azula. You two, get out of here. Go follow the idiot, he ordered. How did you know? Azula asked him. How could he have known that they were planning to leave? I know you too, he replied without taking his eyes off the soldiers. Now go. I'll hold them off for as long as I can. No, she instantly protested. You can come with us. We can get out of here, all of us. He just turned and looked at her. When did you cut your hair? He asked. Don't change the subject, Naruto. You don't have to. She was interrupted when Naruto kissed her. She just went into shutdown at the feeling of his lips meeting hers. When he broke it, a small part of her was disappointed. Don't worry. I won't be gone for long. We'll talk once I'm back, all right? He told her before looking at her brother. Zuko, you two have to leave, now. The scarred dragon nodded in agreement, took Azula's hand, and ran. After stumbling a few steps, she regained her balance, yanked her hand out of his, and ran alongside him. Now then, Naruto said, turning back to face the soldiers, where were we? Please, Lord Naruto, don't do this, the captain begged. If you continue, I'll have no choice but to arrest you. I've served beside you, sir. I've fought by your side. Don't make me do this. Naruto heard the uncertainty underneath his begging. A lot of the soldiers facing him felt the same. And while he was glad they thought of him so, he couldn't let it him doubt. You have your duty, Captain, and I have mine, he replied, shifting into a stance. You know, you should be glad that Iroh isn't here, the QB commented. And why is that? He asked silently. He would be laughing his ass off at the irony. No, he'd be sitting on his ass, drinking tea, and then he would have been laughing. Fair point, Kit, the fox admitted. They didn't say anything else as Naruto threw himself at the soldiers. He wasn't going to kill any of them, he had seen enough dead people to last him a lifetime. He was just going to stall them. Everyone ran down the mountain path, trying to get away from the capital. Sokka looked back to see the airships flying over the ridge of the volcano. Try and find cover. He ordered the invasion force when he saw that hatches were opening on the bottom of the airships. I think we're about to see some bombs. Aang, Katara, and Appa landed down next to him. Tof bent a large slab of rock to jet out over their heads to protect them. The action was repeated with other groups. The bombs began to fall, causing big explosions where they hit the ground. A couple of the bombs hit the slab, causing it to crack. It would have fallen on top of them, had Tof not stabilized it with rock columns. The tanks kept going down the mountainside, despite the bombs. Once they had delivered their payload, the airships kept on flying. Why aren't they turning around to attack us again? Katara asked. They're headed for the beach, Aang noted, before realizing what that meant. They're going to destroy the submarines. How are we all going to escape? Sokka asked. If the subs were destroyed, they would be completely trapped. We're not, Hakoda answered, being helped forward by Bato. He turned to face his father. Then our only choice is to stand and fight. We have the Avatar. We could still win. Yes, with the Avatar we could still win, on another day. He took his hand off Bato, standing on his own. You kids have to leave. You have to escape on Appa together. He ordered them all. What? Katara asked, surprised by her father's words. We can't leave you behind. We won't leave anyone behind. You're our only chance in the long run, he told her. You and Sokka have to go with Aang somewhere safe. It's the only way to keep hope alive. The youngest of our group should go with you, Bato suggested. The adults will stay behind and surrender. We'll be prisoners, but we'll all survive this battle. I've got some experience with Fire Nation prisons, Tyro said, joining the conversation. It's not going to be easy, but we'll get by. They're at the beach already, Sokka exclaimed, getting everyone's attention. The airships flew over Hugh and the others and began dropping bombs. Though and Du tried to destroy the bombs using their waterbending. Hugh tried to bend his monster to catch the bombs and throw them away. But one of the bombs hit his left arm destroying it. Another landed on its head and went through. The swamp monster exploded and sent seaweed everywhere. Both Tho and Du had a giant clump land on them. While they were stuck, the clump also had Hugh, who was unharmed, save for a few burns. The rest of the bombs struck the submarines, completely destroying them. Everyone on the mountain path could only watch as it happened. They decided to go with the idea of the kids escaping. 
Tove helped the mechanist put Teo in Appa's saddle. Bye, son, the mechanist said. Bye, dad. I'm really proud of you, Teo said, hugging his father. Tove dropped the earth column the mechanist was standing on back into the rock, taking the mechanist with it. The duke tried to climb up Appa himself. He was holding on to Appa's horn and was going to fall had Pipsqueak not helped him up. I'll miss you, Pipsqueak, he said. Take care, the duke, Pipsqueak replied. We'll be back for you, dad, Haru told Tyro, hugging him. If we don't escape on our own first, Tyro said. His son smiled and bowed to him. We lost today, Hakoda told his children before kneeling to them. But we've never been this close. We tasted victory, and that counts for something. We'll miss you, Dad, Katara told him, giving him a hug. Bye, Dad, Sokka joined in the hug. We won't be apart for too long this time, I promise. Hey, can someone do me a favor? Toe asked everyone there. What is it? But Toe asked back. If you guys see the hippo or the boulder, tell them. She looked away so no one could see the tears glistening in her eyes. Tell them I was happy to see them again. We will, Tof, he told her. Sokka and Katara got aboard Appa. Katara walked up to Aang, who was crying. He looked at her, sniffed, wiped his tears away, and stood up to address the ones who were staying behind. Thank you all for being so brave and so strong, he told them. I'm gonna make this up to you. He sat back down on Appa's head while Katara got back in the saddle. The sky bison took off, leaving the adults behind. As they flew away, an airship appeared behind them. Should we follow them, my lady? A soldier asked Yao Jing. No, they're too fast, she answered. Besides, just let the cowards run. They'll be back. Everyone on Appa took notice of the airship behind. When it didn't follow them, Aang turned to face the others. I know just the place to go where we'll be safe for a while, the Western Air Temple. He told them. He urged Appa on. He tried to focus but, in his mind, Naruto's words kept repeating themselves. There are no easy ways out. Unbeknownst to them, a war balloon followed them, carrying a brother and sister. Naruto stood in the middle of the soldiers. Many of them were all lying on the ground, groaning in pain. He was a little better off but not by much. His whole body felt bruised and numb. Nice going guys, he told them. You fought hard and did everything you could. I don't think I could last another round like that. Hearing footsteps charging towards him, he saw more soldiers standing before him, reinforcing the few that remained on their feet. From the looks of things, there had to be at least four platoons worth of men facing him. I just had to say it. Lord Naruto, stand down, the new captain ordered, his tone unyielding. While he hadn't served under the blonde, he knew enough to think of him as a hero. In a different situation, he would have been honored to meet him. But now he was a traitor. That meant he would be dealt with as a traitor should. The soldiers on the ground were starting to get back to their feet. As they joined the fresh men, their eyes were weary but resolute. What would come next would hurt, both physically and emotionally. But they did it once and would do it. Everyone waited for what came next. The silence was so thick with tension that one couldn't even cut through it with a knife. Then Naruto did what the soldiers did not expect. I surrender, he said aloud. His jian dropped and his hands raised up over his head. His body, realizing that it wasn't fighting anymore, bombarded him with new information. He hurt a lot. Arrest him, the captain ordered. A couple of the soldiers ran forward and forced the blonde to his knees. He didn't resist.